Why is it it generational? Maybe. I don't know. All I know is this, like, the new... I saw an article that said is that, that Twitch are we that's Twitch, you? and okay. I don't I don't know if tw- we're, tw- we're 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 two places at the okay. same time. Don't be intimidated. You're just as pretty and fabulous as you were. Did okay, I ask you to so do fine. this? Thank you. So hi, I'm Coach MK Fleming, Mary Catherine Fleming, uh, and I, that's the first time I, I'm starting to introduce myself by where I work. Oh, it was well, like I work thing. nowhere anymore. I'm just Coach MK. I work for myself. Ah, I, just, I work for no one except DJ Palmatier. Today, oh Jesus! Wait, well, yeah, I mean, I kept like I whittled everything down like two private clients. Um, and he's, he's one of your two. He's one of my two, and um, chosen one. Yeah, and uh, boy, he earned it today. Jesus, Eric. This is Erica Hanlon. Hi. And she has um, more uh, clinical expertise than any sh- any human should have to have working in places the rest of us don't want to go. Yeah. I feel like you were. I I don't. I think I do a lot sometimes for the community, and I'll get very proud of myself for the things that I do. And then you're like, I used to work in a jail, <laughs> working with sex offenders, and I just had to get away from the home mm-hmm. with that, with, with all the teenage offenders, the boys. And I'm like, wait, you did what? You just had some heartbreaking jobs. I did. Yeah. So, um, should I talk about myself? Yes. Okay, so. I'm learning things about you for the first time as we started. Yes, so, so all about me. Yay, let's talk about me, my favorite subject. So, um. <laughs> it should be. Right, so let's see. I, um, so I'm a licensed professional counselor. I don't know where to even, like, where do you look? Which one? Like, you can look at either one. one. And then this one. Which one intimidates you less? Um, I don't know. I don't know. There's like all these things popping up, and I want to read them. Okay. So, um, so I have my master's degree in counseling and psychology, and we were talking about. I worked in a group home for like four and a half years. It was Boys Town. Have you ever heard of Boys Town? Yes, I have. Yeah, there's like a movie, right? With yes. Like Spencer Tracy and Mickey Rooney. It's like black, all in black and white. So that's wild. Yeah. So it was not all in black and white when I worked there. Good. Spencer and Mickey were not there. Although Mickey Rooney did come for some kind of anniversary, and he was um, he like read a poem that made no sense. It was like kind of sad. <laughs> so speaking to the chair. Yeah. Like Lady Swift. So yeah. So that's where I worked for like five years, getting cursed out like on on the regular. Um, I know what that feels like. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have to go to the bathroom and cry? No, I mean, that was, when I was on the trading floor, yes. But, like, recently people curse, and I'm just like, if you don't pay my mortgage, you can go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I would get cursed out. Although, um, really, the last year wasn't so bad. Like, I had a really awesome group of girls. It was, like, more of a long-term setup, whereas, you know, where I worked in Atlanta for two years was, like, it was 21 days, and it was really rough. Um, so it was, like people calling me names and throwing things at me and saying, like, really crazy shit <laughs> on the regular. Uh, and then, so then I went to practice. Sounds like all the sounds. Right? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Some of them got a little crazy. A little bit crazy. Yeah, a little bit crazy. Yeah. Got a little wild. Yeah. Um, and then, what did I do? So then, yeah, I worked in a jail, and I worked actually private practice for a while with um, some sex offenders. And now, my phone's going off. Um, it's telling you it's time to start. Oh, it is. It's official. It's official start time. And then, yeah, so then I, uh, now I work for an insurance company and I give, like, wellness tips. That's awesome. And I work at home and I'm, like, in, like, workout clothes all day long. It's amazing. That's wonderful. So this is the most dressed up you've ever seen me. It is. And it may be the most dressed up you've ever seen me ever again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, I, I wish I could say the same. This is, um, this is my part of my New Year's. My roar. I don't. I don't do resolutions because I don't think there's any part of me that needs changing. Um, but I do look back on things that made me happy and say, "Hey, I'm going to do more of that." Yeah. And one thing that made me happy in 2018 and that would be an easy thing to do more of is dry my hair. It looks really good. Thank you. I don't think I've ever seen it down in person. Uh, you know, it almost never is because it's wet. And I'm running. I would. I go for when back in 2016 was the worst. Right. I was. Running twice a day, I was doing strength in the middle, so I was always like coming from a run or a shower, and there's yeah. just no point in drawing yeah. here in between. Um, now that I'm between now and that stage of fitness, which is not going to be this year, I'm like, I might as well draw my hair more. Can't yeah. go quite to makeup yet, like it's painful to put it on for uh, 
family photos. Oh. Like we just recently did where I'm like, it looks I just, good. Thank, well, thank you. It just doesn't feel, I can't believe I used to do that every day. It doesn't uh, feel natural yeah. and I'm putting it on and it just doesn't, I don't look like me and it doesn't, you know, I mean, it, it's not about looking like better or worse. It's just as soon as I start, I'm like, that's very orange. And huh? this is very blue. Uh, and Wait, I just get very, well, I mean, I just think the eye, the eye, the eye shadow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nothing about it feels natural and I'm just like, ugh. So when it's done, I'm like, I hope this works. I run out the door. Um, so yeah, and it'll be, I don't know that that'll ever become a daily habit again. Yeah. So, which leads me to resolution number two, pretty things. I was, went to, um, I was dropping my kids up for preschool once and I told this one, the mom, this story, like you have inspired by 2019, by the way. And she was like, how? Um, I, I, she always looks fabulous. Every time I see her, she's, her name's uh, Coco Smith and she's one that makes this jewelry, um, for Coco. Wait, she make what you're wearing? Yeah. It's all vintage Oscar oh. De La Renta repurposed. Yeah. She like, I go to her house and I'm just bringing a bottle of wine and I'm like, can we play in the sparkle room? In the sparkle room, <laughs> she's got a, a gigantic like kitchen table Princess, huh? and the whole room, it's just like sparkly bobbles. Like the Ariel from the Little Mermaid will wash her shit in there. It's just so great. So, yeah, it's super fun. But she, um, I remember run, walking past her in the school. This was a couple of years ago. And um, I was like, you always look so put together. She's like, dry your hair and big ear, dry hair and big earrings does it all. And she kept going. And I'm like, oh, oh, dry hair and big earrings. And I absorbed that. And I noticed it every time I see her, like, dry hair and big, dry hair and big earrings. earrings. And I'm like, I can do that. I can do that. You can do that. She keeps a bag of different big earrings in her, or in her purse. And, um. Yeah, so I'm like, it, it, so far, we are, we are past the day in January when everyone, like, drops their New Year's resolutions. So we're almost into February. Yeah, we are. The 20th. It's the 18th is drop day, quit day, right? National. The, wait, there's a quit day? Yeah, it's the day when people just give up on other New Year's resolutions. And it's like a national thing. I mean, I wouldn't say it's a national thing. It's but like, it's the trend. Like, yeah. Okay. Like, no one keeps, like, all those resolutions by the 18th, they haven't happened and you, you forgot about them. Yeah. Yeah, so these are two roars, moors, <laughs> that I'm still doing, and I'm quite proud of that. Like, we're it looks home. good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to have shine. to take that secret, though, like big do earrings it. and dry hair. Do it. Yeah, I don't know how to do makeup either. Brendan had this big event last um, last spring. It was like this thing for the St. Patrick's Day Parade, and it was black tie, and I flipped out. For the St. Patrick's Day Parade? Yeah. Yeah, it that's was, random. Yeah, it was it was like the people who put together the parade and he had to go and like speak at it and it was black tie and so I was referring to it as Irish prom which he did not think was that funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he did not think it was funny. And I started watching all these I think it's great. Right? And I started watching YouTube tutorials about how to do my makeup because I was like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do it. And um, the YouTube tutorials, I was like, this is overwhelming. So They're I, not helpful. I paid somebody to do my makeup, and it was, I looked, I, I, it was, it was bad. Yeah. Like, they put on fake eyelashes that were so big, they were hitting, they were hitting my eyebrows. And I wore, I went straight from there to, like, Walgreens with my big sunglasses on. I looked like I was, like, I don't know, Jackie O or some celebrity, like, <laughs> trying not to be recognized, like, going through Walgreens, like, grabbing makeup remover and, like, things to try and re replace the whole thing, because it was, I went home and I just, like, You were Kate Middleton. You were Kate Middleton on her wedding day. Wait, what is this? Oh, when Kate Middleton married, um, Prince William? Prince William, yeah. They, I, rumor has it, she did not like her makeup job, so she took it all off and did it herself. Really? Like minutes before walking down the aisle, people were freaking out because she already had the dress on. Like the multi thousand dollars. That makes dress. me like her more. Yeah. <laughs> Being a make that she's a control freak. Tell me about that. Oh, tell me about being a control freak. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and I have gone for walks, and I have said if the running coach thing does not work out, that you could absolutely parlay your skills into being a therapist. Well, I, you know, except that the thing I've learned the hard way being a coach now is that I need to get away from anything that lets me charge by the hour. So I'm like, we need a different model. Yeah. I like this. So I've been focusing this year, or at least that for 2019 until the IEP's done. My, my goal for me is to be like, what do I like doing? Where before I start making commitments, where if like one day I don't show up, okay, Coach MK, I paid you fifty dollars for this month's podcast. You didn't come on Saturday, so I want a five dollar discount on next month. 
before, I just want I just want to avoid before I so yeah. before I start taking money for stuff I need to figure out what it is I'm willing to do for free and then st before I start and then see what sort of time I have left over and then yeah. start charging for that time later so um, I'm in I'm in very I'm kind of you know, been so grateful for the IEP process to have a little time to figure that out yeah yeah because it's, it's been good the podcast is so much fun I really enjoy it you are um, on fire with the podcast thank you thank yeah. you. That means a lot coming from, like, someone that's actually professional at, like, giving advice. Because I'm not qualified to give advice to anybody for anything. And I, I think that needs to be part of my intro. By the way, what am I, I am a run coach. But we're never talking about the running. At the same time, I'm not a therapist. I'm really good at giving unsolicited advice and then not taking it myself. I'm really good at being like, here's what you do. Yeah. You do this, and then I don't do any of those things myself. Well, it's because when you're in that moment, it's hard to remember yeah. Like, that's why I'm like, all he needs is a mantra and a framework. And the all, my whole life always comes down to the mantra. Like, when you can foresee shit coming and you have, like, a little phrase to cling to to kind of walk you through it to keep you focused and centered. Um, when it happens and then it's behind you and you're like, I survived. Okay, that's great. And you just kind of keep going. But you have that framework. Like, what do I need to get? Yeah. Okay, where else can I get it? Do I have to have this meeting with this person that is stressing me out? Mm -hmm. Is this, because I'm from a small town, y'all. I mean, if anyone from Carthage, Tennessee is watching this, or Smith County in general, the whole county is 15,000 people and it's freaking enormous. Um, the thing you learn the hard way, and this was real fun to teach my husband about when he came to meet my family for the first time before we got married. I was like, whatever you do, he was going to, the, there was a CrossFit gym that had just opened. It was like 2010. There's this is a, in Smith County. It's in Smith County, right? Okay. That's what I said. I'm like, we have CrossFit. Alice is like, yay! You don't have pizza delivery. Time. You don't have. I can't get a cell phone signal past the Hardys, but you have Hardys. a CrossFit. Yeah, Hardys. It and is Sonic. Tennessee. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's Tennessee. Hardy. Oh my gosh. They, so I was so over there, but we had CrossFit, and he I, when he went, I'm like, okay. Mom was like, you, you're gonna tell him or should I? I'm like. I will try to explain it. I just need you to back me up because he's not going to believe it when I tell him. I was like, don't piss off anybody with the last name Kemp. Just don't. It meet somebody, ask them what their last name is, and from there you determine how to behave. Be nice to everyone. They they know me. They so they know who you are. Like when you say you're sure, like because they don't know you, they assume like, oh, what are you doing here with that question? Yeah. And as soon as you say our family's name, some people will not talk to you. Because this is a small town, and that's 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 not always a bad thing, but if you must talk, don't piss anyone off with the last name Kemp. Because at the time he was the general sessions judge, and this is again a small county, and this means this elected official got to decide everything from like traffic fines to custody disputes between uh, families that were divorcing. So this is what, this is what a small town is like. You need like every single person you interact with is either in charge of or connected to. A scarce resource that you can't that you might have to drive elsewhere to get there's like one basketball team if you kid might if your kid kind of likes basketball you just want the coach to not hate you and yeah there's like you know what this makes me think of what that movie? movie no I well I haven't seen that show but the movie Doc Hollywood yeah where it's yeah. like yeah everybody you know that movie pissed me off I watched it and I was like they're making fun of us Aww. because yeah whenever anybody talks about flyover country I'm like that's because you won't go you could make it. You could be nice to people you don't know. Anyway, so I get, I get a little, I get a little. It is a very, it is a very good movie. Don't get me wrong. But I, I laughed about that whole like you need to understand like anything yeah. you want. If you piss off the wrong person, there's a right. domino effect that you don't feel in a big city. Like you've got to know those power structures and how to move through. Right, because if you don't like this, you know, this doctor, you can go see another doctor. Yeah. So the thing that I. <laughs> Or the dentist. You don't piss off the dentist. Don't piss off the dentist. <laughs> you just could like find him another church. Oh, there is yeah. one Methodist church, y'all, and they, they they tolerate a lot. Oh yeah, were they tolerant? I mean, tolerant by your standard of the oh. word. I mean, no. <laughs> but they were the least restrictive of the churches. Oh okay. So everybody made fun. That's of them. the one you would be. Yeah. Oh, that's probably yes. where I would go. Yeah. No, that's not no. where I would go. You wouldn't. You wouldn't last long. Yeah. And that's but, that's, but that's the question. But though, I, tell you, right? I have to tell you this. I'm not qualified to be a therapist, but I know how to navigate power back. structures in a closed system where it's, it's you know, you got to figure it out. So 
the first question I always ask myself is, do I have to do this? If the answer is no, I don't. It's like, do I have to engage with you? What do I need to get? Can I get it elsewhere? We ain't having that phone call. I'm not having that meeting. I will, it's not that I hold a grudge forever. It's just like, you don't get to have that power over me. Yeah. You know, because I've lived in places where people have that power and there's nothing you can do. And if I'm going to create it here in the big city of Denver. So I'm not qualified to give advice, but I do it anyway, especially when, you know, I have a microphone and I don't find out later until later who's listening. Yes. It's my Twitch channel. I'll do what I want. It is my Twitch channel. I'll do what I want. It's pretty good. So, but I know what you guys are here for. Yay. But and we should probably start ambling towards it. If you have anything to say, I cannot see the comments on Facebook Live. It's better to put it in the chat or send it over to Susan or feel free to text me. Can't see that either yet. But hi, we appreciate you being here for the very first of what I'm hoping will become a recurring thing, Sendoku Book Club. I want to know who's having a drink. I'm, I'm not intoxicated right now, by the way. I might be soon. You know how stressful my morning was watching DJ run Houston? Do you know how hard it is to care? It's a lot of work to care. Caring oh is, is sharing, but caring is stressful. I do, what you can't do is, is share that burden that caring is. That's true. You know? That's true. I wish. That's yeah. why I laughed at the notion of caring and sharing. I'm like, literally, you can't share. You really can't <laughs> share caring. <laughs> if I could, you can't outsource it. You're, like, you, like I can't clean things. Yeah, I'm jealous of your help. I sometimes think about how you have all these babysitters and all this help. Well, it's because we don't do anything. I mean, some people take vacations. Uh, well, some people buy mean. new clothes. I see what you mean. <laughs> I'm like, we have sitters. And but it makes your life that much better. Yeah. Yeah. You know what we just started doing? I'm sorry, I'm going off topic here. Okay? Oh. So I just found out that there is, like, this company in our neighborhood that does your laundry. Like, it, yeah. ha it doesn't charge per piece or per, per pound. They give you these containers and you can pack them as full as you possibly can. <gasps> it's wonderful. It's amazing. Stapleton just has everything. We have everything. If you ever get tired of living here. No. Okay. No. <laughs> it's hard. I mean, the only draw to Stapleton would be to be that much closer to the airport. To Alex Lanton. Oh, my yeah. My physical therapist. Yeah. He's very close to me. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of He's very convenient. It is so inconvenient from here. Because I have to get on 25 it's and go all the way up and around. There's no, yeah. or I have to drive up. Or you have to go through like a bazillion stoplights. Oh, it's the worst. I mean, so I just used to live like down the street from here. Yeah. And I moved out to Stapleton like kicking and screaming. Stapleton's like eight and a half miles. It's not far. <laughs> so I mean, it's just, it's just not direct. It's eight and a half miles as the crow flies on the back of a broomstick. But when you live in Denver, I mean, if you're in your car more than 15 minutes, it feels like a lifetime. A long time. It feels like a really long time. Totally. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, perspective shifts as far as how long you can be in your car. My you entire life remember. occurs in a two-mile radius. Yeah, because you have everything. Yeah. I mean, you've got the park right there. Mm -hmm. You've got all the restaurants and bars right there. Uh -huh. What do you have? Like, groceries. Do you go up to, like, Super Target? Or what do you do? I Instacart everything because it's free. Uh, I'm so close. Does anybody even want, is that a comment? What is that? Possibly. It, is it my husband harassing us? Because I just, I just taught him how to twitch, like right before I came taught over. Taught him how to twitch. <laughs> it sounds like a, it's such an important life skill. I mean, he started sending me private messages saying, whisper, whisper, because he thought the term whisper was really funny. That's hilarious. These are, yay, that's so, hey, Laura's drinking with us. Yay! And Suze is drinking coffee. Suze, you might need to drink some wine after winning the lottery. So my three days at the fair people got real smart because Susan has the best ideas. Don't talk to Susan unless like you really want to have a great influence. And she decided that they decided they were gonna drop for the Vermont 100K. They have not run three days at the fair yet, but they're already like committing to it. I'm like, you understand that's longer. They're like, yeah. So my three days at the fair people will then be running 63 miles. I think maybe six weeks later. I'm glad there are people Yay, with ambitions. You. I am like that's exciting. It is. I want to cheer from much. afar. It means I get to go to Vermont this summer. Oh, that does sound kind of nice though. <laughs> we'll take the kids. It'll be great. Oh my god. 
somebody the other day was talking about a race where it was, um, oh, it was my, my brother's girlfriend. He was like, she's going to run this 24 hour race. And I was like, is it three days at the fair? Cause I know about three days at the fair. I've totally heard about it. And he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Pull no, the camera really closer so we can read some of this. Your, if your vision is any better than Oh, mine. my vision is garbage. Is garbage? It's That's terrible. awesome. Or at least I wouldn't have stand up so, so far. Small. Credit where credit is due. It's Tamara's fault. Hello, Marissa. Hi from Philly. We're going to Philly soon. No drinking, but the stories of Carthage is just nostalgic for me. Small towns, all the same. Yep. Better them than me. I feel you. Oh, my God. So, wait. Does that, is that, is that to say you're not going to come support us, Axelrod? That's disappointing. Axelrod is on. Hello. Axelrod's on. I know. And say hi to Ross. She, they just came back from uh, Paris, and they sent me... Um, I know Shal is uh, Shal, who's like the, the the chocolate. It's like hot chocolate. Okay. My daughter saw me. She's like, "Charred? Is that vegetable?" And I'm like, <laughs> "I do not think Sarah would have sent me a vegetable." No. But I will double check with her. She was very serious. She said some vegetable from Paris. I was like, "Yeah, that's tacky in the Shire." If it's from Paris, it's still probably better. Than I'm like a Shal, not Shard, but whatever. She looked at it very quickly. Clearly, I took French. So I got yeah. D's in French. You drink more. <laughs> uh, maze balls. So, yeah, I still can't see. We'll just get up whenever we feel like. It's super so, tiny. So, once again, hi, I'm Coach MK. And this is Eric, my friend Erica. Hello. Who is, uh, you know, smarter than I am and is actually versed in this uh, stuff. So, the whole idea that I have for the Sudoku Book Club was I did not know that this was a word, uh, first of all. This, this is actually from the mind of Susan. I mean, this is one of her ideas that are wonderful and not painful, um, where she, uh, we were, I was talking about all the, some, the, I don't remember the, exactly how we got into it, but something like a book that I hadn't read yet, and she's like, well, there's a Japanese word for that, and didn't you live in Japan? And I'm like, well, I didn't need that word to get home drunk from a bar or to work the next day, so no, I don't know that word. Um, and that's where I learned about Sundoku, and I became obsessed because I have Tons of books. Like, you haven't been upstairs to see. I think I saw on your camera once. You, like, turned the camera in a different direction. And I was like, <laughs> yes, look at all the books. I don't They're like amazing. I, you know, books that make me, I'm not that I go Marie Kondo on it. I think her 30 book, book rule is asinine, I can't you guys. That. Asinine. That is not science. That is some woman just saying. The other stuff I haven't, I don't, I, I haven't absorbed. But she doesn't talk about that on Netflix. I will say that. I think it was in her book. It, it might have been in her book. I've seen articles about it because if you if you Google it, like Marie Kondo Sudoku, it, it like people just get really mad. Like 30, I want nothing to do with Netflix series because of her 30 book rule. And I'm like, that is some bullshit. Bullshit. So I've got tons of books. And um, I, I, I remember Dimity even making fun of me on a podcast for it because uh, we were filming one right after a big shipment had just arrived. Um, a shipment I, of books. A shipment of books. Okay. They're all about running. I buy, um, so when there, I, I have very specific niches that I get super excited about. And I have um, orders if, with booksellers all over the place. If you get anything in with this title from this author or anything from this author that has been out of print for, I don't know, like, 50 years or something Damn. that are really hard to get a hold of. Okay. Um, I'm like, I will pay, and I throw out a number I know that I will be the first person they call because they're not going to forget that conversation. So I, I've i done that with books. I'm very proud of that. So I have, but those are the yeah. books that I read. And I read them carefully with gloves on because they're old, and then they go back in the slip cover, and I take photos of the pages so that I can go back and see them over and over. I take... I'm, I'm very much a bibliophile. Like, I have a Kindle, and the Kindle goes where I do, and I yeah. don't read books on my iPad. Um, and I'm very selective about, like, when it comes to a current book, like like the books that we're going to talk about today, I very rarely purchase these. I will purchase a new book. If it's important enough to purchase new, I will purchase it in a hardcover form. And if they don't offer a hardcover form, I assume it's going to be fine on my Kindle. And if it's on my Kindle, I'll read it when I have time, which is not that often. Which is like, so when no, is that? So real, the real Sudoku list is like my, my backlog and my Kindle. Okay. But I also have books that um, only come with hardcover copies because they're pretty. And I mean to read them, but I just don't. It's like I will read them when I have a free moment. There's a stack next to the bed 
Um, and I can talk through, like, I know why I bought them. I stand by it. They're not purchases that I regret. I don't yeah. look at the books and feel regret. I don't look at the shoes and feel regret. I don't look at the jewelry and feel regret. I schedule a date night. And we have... Uh, our, we have Kindle date nights, which I think I've talked about in the past oh. on some of the previous podcasts. We do, we still do those. Like he'll take his Kindle, I'll take mine. We'll go out, we ignore each other and read. Um, and it's it's best at timed if we finish our books in this because we both read really quickly. Yeah. And it's best time if we finish our books while we're on the date, so then we can have a drink or two and talk about it before we come back home. You don't read the same book. No. Okay. Almost never. Okay. My husband is very. What does he like to read? Boring shit. I mean, I love him, but he's reading all, he's, he, he will get excited about a topic and dive down a rabbit hole of books about the topic. I get excited about a topic and go down a Google click hole. Um, it's a very different way of approaching the same thing. For yeah. anything running related, like, as soon as that book arrives, I get it, I read it cover to cover, I take notes, I annotate it, just like I'm going to be tested on it, um, <laughs> and then it goes in the shelf uh, for, you know, with the Dewey Decimal System so I can find it because I have a lot of books. Um, and I'm very, I, that's, that, that is the thing I really want to do in my next house. And I get excited every time I meet a librarian. Cause I'm like, Oh, I can get you to come help me. Cause my, our, my next house, I'm going to have a walk-in closet and I'm going to have, and my husband and I, this is when I knew I really wanted to marry him. Like, I mean, I wanted to marry him, but then I was like, Oh, well, this is, yeah, this is true love. This is true love. We both want to have, um, we, we see those like expansions that have the round room. I know what I would do with that round room. That bookshelves. round room would become the bookshelves where we would have With the, the ladder, ladder. A cl- the, ladder. the ladder around that the room, around. and, and the, the one that goes across. Wait, what's the one that goes across? Oh my gosh! The, so there is a house that did this somewhere in Denver, and I remember seeing it. They took out. Is so it like that, a catwalk? Well, because the house is so ugly, but it, yeah, it's oh. like a catwalk in there. So it was a, it was a three story house, and this thing on the okay. side looked like a cat, like. It was odd, like, make it look like a Bavarian castle. I can't imagine the conversation <laughs> with the architect. Okay. But it looked like they had taken Rapunzel's tower and stuck it in the side of the house. Okay. And, they, and it couldn't be removed somehow. Like, okay. it couldn't be changed. Okay. So, long story short, the Mewis, when they, um, this ended up in, like, 5280 Magazine. Um, and someone, um, someone showed it to me, because I don't read that magazine. Cool. Um, like in the line at the grocery store. But they had taken, so they had taken out the floors in the, in the, in the, in the, in tower. the tower. Yes. And made it floor to ceiling, three floors of bookshelves with ladders that went around and catwalks that went across. Okay. I want that. I want I'm like, I have to have that now. And I want it to be all running books on, the, on like, Wait, all shelf. running books? There aren't that many running books. But like, they're like, one will be my running books and then like okay. the others we can, we can like share it. So this is my dream, and it's like it's not about reading all of them. Yeah. It's about the possibilities that come with. I could learn about Kuga if only I had time to practice it. The irony it's is like, like coziness, right? Like yeah. candles and yes. coziness. If I have time to light candles and be cozy, I probably have time to read a book about something I don't understand. About Huga. Yeah. I just feel happy that I know how to pronounce it. Yeah, right? You clearly you've been playing with Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> no, so like I was I actually, I think Sarah had posted something about Huga like a year ago, and so on Facebook, and so I was like, I need to, more information about this, and so I googled it, and that's where all my information came from. So I from didn't Sarah? Find no, from Google. Okay, but Sarah planted this. I'm seed. like, all my information she, comes from Sarah. That you, is dangerous. Sarah talks to Susan, and they share ideas. Know. You don't know that you oh, planted a seed. Okay, I was hoping I could access the chat room on here since I can't read, but it's. You should be able to. You just have to keep it. You just have to keep it. um... Wait, I have a message. Oh, I bet that's Brendan. It's probably Brendan. It's very funny. So, (laughs) sending me my whisper messages. Oh yeah, see whisper. Is it still a whisper if he sends it live on during broadcast? He he sent it after I taught him about Twitch. Whisper. That's that's my message. That's very cute. Okay. Uh, well, I think Sudoku is a superpower. I love it. I love having these. I love having, and I'm, I, I have never felt ashamed of the books that I haven't read yet. Partially the power of yet. I've never given away a book that I have yet to read. It's not like I eventually lose interest in the book. Right. But maybe because of the books, they just got to go into the Kindle queue. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But I, my, my whole, I remember like we studied when I went to graduate school. The Kindle was new. And I remember studying this. Because at my, my, my grad school, this was in, a, in, in uh, a very fancy Wharton finance class, marketing class. 
and they were talking about the Kindle because everyone thought the Kindle was going to fail. And everyone in my class was like, that is, I like books. I like books. And I was young and single at the time. And, and I, I thought it was terrible. Getting, like the paper, they wanted the whole paper. Yeah, the I, want the, I want the experience. And I thought the same thing. I was like, I don't understand how that's going to be. And then I climbed uh, Mount Kilimanjaro with a group of girls after graduation. And they took my books away because I was over the weight limit. And the two girls that had Kindles were entertained in downtime, and the rest of us had to talk to each other. Fuck that. So I was like, you know what? A Kindle sounds like a very good idea. And I got one. I ordered one the next time I was at a Wi-Fi, like, in Africa. It, 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 and it was shipped to um, where I was living at the time in New York City. And I never looked back. And that was back when I had all kinds of time to read, and any, I couldn't buy enough books to keep me entertained. Plus, it's like immediate gratification, right? You're like, yeah. I want this book. Bing! And then you have it. This book, I would think you'd like this book. You are correct, Google! Amazon! Like this, Yay! Like this one I ordered and I had to wait two days. Which is a lifetime. A long time. It's like the equivalent of driving longer than 20 minutes. I mean, you didn't Denver. have to. You could pay for it. Yeah, that's good. But I wanted to take notes. Overnight shipping. I needed notes, right? Yes! And all those things. Yay! Yay! So, the word Sudoku, there are several words, now, Jap which is not to say that Japanese, which Japan is not, is, is, a, is a culture free from judgment, because it isn't, um, but the whole, that they have a word Sudoku, it, um, it, it is not a judgment of a person, their spending habits. There's nothing, there's no negative connotation implied in the word. There's also yeah. a Japanese word for eating yourself into bankruptcy. And okay. there's no judgment laden in that word either. We would just call it a foodie. He has no, as you know, the or a, a cinephile. That you like, you always know that one person that has a hobby and nothing but that hobby. They would just like, if anything, like that. They are extremely devoted to this one area. Yeah. And it's like, but they don't have a four hundred one k. I don't know. You know. Yeah. But that that it's just there's so it's it's a statement of fact. Less than a judgment thing. Whereas we tend to, in America, just in general, it's all judgy. Like, why do you have all these books if you wouldn't read them? It's a waste of money. Like, it's a moral failure that you would waste money and time yeah. or that you would have a goal and not work towards it by having all these books. Um, does that make right. sense? There's, yeah. we, we, we are, we are a, a, a culture of multiple judgy layers. Um, where, and where Because it's, like, fun. What? Because <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just but like, it makes us feel good about ourselves, right? Like, yeah, not doing that, I'm not doing that, winning that life, yay! But it's easy to do. Like, I, the, you, I don't have this flaw that you have. Well, if I had all these books, I would read them. So I don't kid myself. And this is not how I, 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 I everything about you yeah. is actually a story about me. Um, it's so I, I'm kind of obsessed with this word, free from judgment. I called a couple of friends of mine who are, you know, I lived there for four years and I didn't learn enough about Japan or anything having to do with it because I had, I was, I had my own shit, man. I was, uh, you know, freshly raped um, off, off of that, being sent to that, finishing two more years with my rapist on campus um, and then having to go and then getting a job abroad. And when I showed up, I was a hot mess and when I left, I was a hot mess. So you had a brain your trauma. trauma. I did and I, um, you know, didn't. So anyway, my time there was, I, not that it's full of regret necessarily, it was, part of my path, but um, there are definitely opportunities to learn that I didn't take because I was busy doing other things with trauma. So I find, uh, when, when I, I became obsessed with this concept of Sendoku, I became obsessed with um, the notion that why do I get defensive when people make comments like, you can't possibly read all those books, or when the, the, the shipment arrived that day um, before the podcast is filming, and it's like, you bought 80 books, I'm like, yes. I'm I really jealous. <laughs> 80 books. Well, I, there, there are a lot of reasons behind it, but then I don't want to go too far off the reservation. Like, I, I'm a former investment banker, and I do believe that, like, you put a good corporation, and a, a good rule of thumb is a third reinvested into R&D. Um, when it, coming from your, coming off the top before you've done anything, like, after your needs are met, what you could call it profit, take a third of that figure and reinvest it in the company, and then play with whatever's on top. Like, that is, that's a decent management function. So that is how I justified that. I got my first paycheck. It's cut. I, 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 I had a third. <laughs> I took a third of it. I bought book. And it was amazing. And totally a wise business investment. And I wrote that shit off of my taxes. 
Well, it was I, great. And I was saying though that like there's evidence that shows um, that the more books you have in your home, that it is linked to high performing children. Yes. So even if they're not around books. No, I think they have to, it's like in the home. How many books are in the home? They go in my office a lot. And there's no judgment yeah. about like what kind of books they are. I mean, they could be pieces of crap. I mean, they could be like bodice terrors. <laughs> bodice, bodice terrors? Bodice rippers. Is that what they're called? Like oh, the romance God. novels, right? Where it's like shh and her bodice is coming off and Fabio I like to think of it as just like a face rumor because like whenever know. somebody starts talking about Fifty Shades of Grey it's always going to be like oh. that super judgy woman in my Pilates class I watched that movie and I got so excited I'm like I want to know that about you oh my god okay. that, did, that, oh my that book just changed conversations I, well I never read it because I heard that it was grammatically like really um, problematic <laughs> grammatically <laughs> problematic yes and I get really judgy about those things so okay. speaking of judgment, fair enough. I will judge somebody who's published who can't write. So I will judge it. Well, um, she started as like Twilight fan fiction, right? I don't know. I think she just like sat down and wrote this like I want to say masturbatory fantasy. <laughs> Sorry, that's my sex offender therapist background. I mean, how many times just... have I cursed so far on this on this stream? Like, I think you're winning. Okay. Well, I just talk about masturbation like easily. But, okay. Um, it's not so, so clearly we need to do more. It's not stuff. socially appropriate. <laughs> no one is here for social appropriation. Okay. All right. Social appropriation. Is but okay. I am. I'm here for the, the Japanese acceptance of books that don't necessarily get read totally. in a timely fashion. Totally. I'm here for it. It's like all of those books that got read. By the way, they were all writing books, and a lot of it was information that I already had. I like going back and see. You don't really understand where you are until you look at where you've come from. And you look at the trends over time. Because, like, the, the Lydiard method was the be-all, end-all. And then jogging came to the States in the 70s. And when you look at the trajectory of distance running over time, and when as women entered the sport, and the beliefs, like, the firmly held medical beliefs, medical beliefs that kept women out of running because it would be too hard and too taxing on our systems, um, it's hard not to get ragey somewhere in your brain. Um, but it's also like, how did we ever believe that? How did we ever do that? Until you go back and look where we were, you really want to understand where we are. Yeah. I'm a big believer in that. So the play, the, the rabbit hole, I choose to slide down face first when it comes to my books all the time is running. Um, and I want to read everything that comes out because I really want to see if with what someone is saying is truly different. Yeah. Um, or is it just a new way of presenting the same information, which is not a bad thing to do, and it's not cheating. Um, what coaches, I, I, what I see my job as as a coach, is to get to know the person. If we're working in a one-on-one context, um, it's also to work on effective cues. Because if my cues aren't good, then you're not getting my message, yeah. and we're not getting the desired result. Yeah. So like the whole lock your cage thing worked really, really well with my local runners that came to the track and saw me and understood what it was yeah. every single time because that, that's two days a week that I'm reinforcing it every time I see you. I see them running. I run past the herd. Lock your cage! And they're like, you know, everybody stands up. Yeah. Well, it's straighter. They know it. And it, it, it appalled me to find, like, people that I've been training with, um, another mother runner for a couple of years. Yeah. Like, that had been with me continuously. That, that I wouldn't call them bad people or bad clients. They weren't. They, they, it wasn't them in any way. It's like, But the this, message was lost in the translation. Mes- yeah. They forget, like, yeah. it's, like, what is lock your cage? So, I think of lock your cage as, so, this is how I do it. I just think of it as good posture. Okay. Um, and so, it's okay. watch, watch me get this wrong. Okay. So, I think of it as like this. Okay. So, I mean, that's my cue for good posture is putting my arms up and bringing them down. Okay. That's what I tend to use before like breathing exercises because it opens up your diaphragm mm-hmm. and then you're able to benefit from like deep breathing exercises. So, that's yes. that's my cue. My shoulder, I, that works. Okay. That works. I like because I remember when I came up with it, people I was telling people to stand up straighter or to sort of tighten up, and they were like, Ugh! and they went forward, which is the opposite of what I wanted. Yeah. So lock your cage was just the idea of bringing your well, your, and your, you your shoulder blades like together this, and, right? yeah, and trying to tap your your waist with your elbows. Yeah. So it's it's rolling. It's not pushing that out and arching your back. It's just like that very subtle. Because a lot of times movement. you'll be 
Yeah. We're like this all the time. Right, but once people think they know that cue or they think they understand what it is, they don't revisit it. So I was like uh, checking this with people and being like, oh, well, you don't know what that is and you don't know what that is. So that means either I need to find other ways to reinforce this message that I've taken for granted as a basic or I need to change the cue. Yeah. One of the ways that you come up with better cues is seeing how, how other coaches are cueing their people and some cues are so strong they've written whole books about them. So that's where books come into play for me and why I'm always like, Matt Fitzgerald wrote another book, what did he say? Oh my gosh, Brad Stilberg wrote another book, what did he say? And Steve Magnus, what did he say? And what did he say? Because there are so many aspects that are, that are really important. Um, and the book, so the book that we're eventually going to talk about, sorry, it's been a while. Um, I like, what? Well, no, out 39 people RSVP'd and a whole bunch of others were like, I'll watch it tomorrow or I'll listen to it on my commute. So I'm like, all right, well, so we ain't in a hurry. Um, so, yeah, so this book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, which is the one that well, we're going to not read together tonight, um, was on Steve Magnus's list of um, books every coach should read. Say who that is. Steve Magnus is one of the greatest coaches alive right now, and he's like fucking 32. I mean, he's so young. He's 32? He's really young. I mean, maybe he's older than 32 now, but he's like the wonder kid that... Um, what, it, it's not that he, he was a good runner. He was, he was a collegiate runner, and he was a high-performing high collegiate runner. But he was the wonder kid that got a PhD in sports psychology and was handpicked by Alberto Salazar to come join the, uh, the Oregon Distance Project way back when. So he was like one of the youngest coaches of professional runners. That is ever lived, and he knows his stuff. He has a blog called The Science of Running. He has a book called The Science with by the same name, Science of Running. And so when I think of the coachy coaches, the ones that only play in that high performing sphere, the ones that won't take a person, that won't take a female on until they've broken 16 minutes and 30 seconds in the 5K, that's, that's steep. Like, we're doing all of the things we've mastered, all of the fundamentals. Now it's truly down to the workouts. Like, the, the issue is truly the plan. Yeah. Steve's your man. Okay. And, he writes, and he writes extensively about that. So um, he, when he speaks, pretty much every coach alive listens still, which is really maddening when you think about how young he is. But it, it's, you know, it's okay. Um, I can get over myself and not think about all the gray hair. But he, um, so, so on his list of books that, that you need to read in order to be a good coach um, is Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And that's, that's where I pulled this one from. And I bought all of those intending to read them, but they're not about running. So they've all taken more time to get through. Than, you can see the chat now? I can see the chat. And so I don't have to, like, squint. But I'm trying to – so Sarah had to go um, – Nurse. Wait, no, she didn't have nurse. nurse. <laughs> no, no. I'm reading this out of order. So she had to go um, for bedtime uh, oh. and read stories for bedtime. But we'll rejoin later. And she also said the Kindle makes it easier to read while nursing. Yes. Um, Susan said, fun, earthquake-proof floor-to-ceiling bookshelves. Bonus, perfect for short people. And there's a link. I need more information about this. And, of course, it's Japanese. Japanese architects, earthquake Proof bookshelves. Of course it is. Is it from Meiji? I don't know. Should I click on the link? Okay, we're clicking on... Oh, look, it like just makes a little... Makes a little... <laughs> I'm so old. You're so funny. No, you're like, so look needed. at this. Look at this. I clicked this link here in the look Twitch chat. Look at this chat. amazing things are happening right now. Oh, look, it's like, a, it's like a ladder, maybe? Ooh, I want that oh. bookshelf. Everybody that's watching, click the link that Susan just put up in the Twitch chat. In this Twitch. is gorgeous. And then, wow, that is something. What? I mean, that's what, what I that's what I do anyway. That is amazing. I mean, because I'm short. I'm like 5'2". I do that anyway, but it probably isn't very safe. It's not, My bookshelves are not designed for the climbing. And she said it is grammatically problematic. Thank you. Fifty Shades of Grey. Yes. And, and yes, Twilight fanfic. Can I just say something really quickly about Twilight before we move on? So... I read all the Twilights, mm -hmm. um, mainly because I had, <laughs> I had a coworker who was like, you have to read them all. They get so good. And so I kept reading it, and I was like, where, when, where does, it, when, does, when, it get good? when does it get good? And um, I, that, was, that was the, I read them all as well, I'll say. Okay. They're very easy to read. They're easy to read. You kind of want to see what happens next, because for various reasons. But I get it. So I'm not, I'm, I'm just, Twilight came out, and I don't think that Fifty Shades of Grey or Twilight, I read, a, I read a, an article about this, neither one of them would have been a smash hit 
and earlier, and it has nothing to do with the culture or the debt word, the changes or where we're at as humanity. It's just a Kindle. Nobody would have been caught dead walking down the street reading young young adult novel like Twilight or Fifty Shades but of Grey. Because no, nobody, nobody knows nobody what knows what you're reading, reading. so every, you can read whatever you want. It is a free thing. Can you imagine like trying to date in New York City and some dude comes over and they look at Twilight? It's like somebody looking at your iPod back in the day yes. to see yes. what kind of music you would listen yes. to. Yes. Like, oh, you're out. Forget, forget you. I mean, and I'll I'll take ownership that I had questionable music. But there are certain, yes. but there are certain things that you would buy on your iPod that you wouldn't I mean, necessarily keep the record of, no. or certain books that you would keep on the Kindle that you wouldn't want the paperback copy of lying around your house. I never thought about that. It's a thing. Buying. Okay. I mean, the internet has changed. Digital revolution has changed the way we consume, what we consume, and it's part of the reason why we consume more. Okay. It's interesting. I believe it. Yay! Yeah. So don't feel bad about all those things you haven't listened to or the books you haven't read yet, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because. Yay, you're just in a place where you can have them. That's all good. No. I so, won't judge. So what I really wanted to kind of do, other than like just hang out with Eric in front of the camera and wear pearls, really big pearls, <laughs> um, was, was talk about what's cool about, about this here book. So Steve McNess is also one that left Salazar around the same time that Kara Goucher did. She, they were, um, he was coaching with Salazar when he realized that there were things going on that he didn't want to be associated with. Uh, the shady, questionable things having to do with drugs and doping. Very dramatic. It was very dramatic. Um, so, uh, again, I, he talks about the stress from his time and how that kind of ties into the book. So why zebras don't get ulcers, the whole premise here, um, and is that uh, if you think about it, being a zebra is pretty stressful. You are someone's dinner. You were put on this earth to be someone's dinner, and you know who that thing is. So the, like most any other animal, um, in the Serengeti, and this researcher did live and, and start uh, kickstart his career in the Serengeti. Um, like any like any other animal down there, you don't need an, a long, ongoing, prolonged cortisol stress response to anything because as soon as the stressor appears, you're either dead or you are running the hell away from it. So three minutes tops, and you're good, and you go back to normal. Yeah. Humans don't. We don't have that luxury. Period. We probably haven't had it for about 70 years. Well, and we can't differentiate between, like, a lion chasing us and, like, being stuck in traffic. Well, and the expectation of the lion chasing you is just as bad as the lion actually chasing you. It can be equally stressful yeah. if you don't have tips or tools to manage right. that. I really like this cover because the zebra is dancing in a dancing. circle. Yeah. They look very, very nice. happy. I mean, have, I mean, these are not these zebras do not have a death sentence. They are zenned out, coming their way. What is your book about? So my book. Okay, no, I didn't read it. What my book? I did not read it. I didn't read your book either. Okay. Um, that so. is the point of the Sudoku book club. We find this is what I want to make this a thing where we just find people who did read the book and talk to them. Yeah. Preferably if, if they wrote it. So I'm part of a Facebook group uh, book club, and so I don't know if any people from that Facebook group are in here. If so, hi. Um, and they picked this book, The Mindful Diet, and then there's a whole, like, extra part of this title. How to Transform Your Relationship with Food for Lasting Weight Loss and Vibrant Health. Um, and I have, full disclosure... You underline things. I've underlined things, but uh, full disclosure, I have only read the first part of this book. So really, like, the intro and the first three chapters, because that was what was assigned in my book. Okay, that's so fair. that is all that I have read, and really, it's mainly been an introduction into like how dysfunctional we think you know we are when it comes to food, and it's there are lots of opportunities here for self reflection. I think it's really great. So that was um, that's what I read so far. That's cool. I mean, there's more to that, obviously. Yeah, there's more. <laughs> what I, than what I just said. Um, I'm happy to explore that more thoroughly. But, uh, yeah, so, and I thought it was good, and I, also, more full disclosure here, I hate self-help books. I, I do, too. I hate them. I hate them. Most of them are full of, like, this cheesy language around hopes and dreams, or yeah. they bastardize, like, fundamental, like, basic psychological tenets. Like, I'm, I'm sure people love books like You Are a Badass hated it. Mm-hmm. I couldn't read it. 
Like, I think I got maybe two chapters in, and I was like, fuck this book. Like, this is how I made six figures and got off my, out of my parents' basement in two months. And I'm like, <clears throat> I, that's, when I started, the, the, when I had that first podcast, clearly I'm still working through issues with that too. You wouldn't believe how many people came to me and they were like, you are selling snake oil. Like, in those terms, like, defend yourself. Like, you were taught, you were too good, you believed this too much, you were too passionate, and it's just hard to take you seriously because I don't trust you. And I'm like, okay then this is probably not going to work, and I, I, I feel you. I get that. So when someone starts a book with, I have all the answers, and you will too, I'm like, and if those same clients that were calling me the same old salesman love that book and it resonates with them, I'm like, why? <laughs> Ugh. But you know what? If it helps somebody, then if it helps you, then, then, then great. I'm sorry she got id, ego, and all of that stuff mixed up. Yes. Um, but if it helps somebody... If it helps someone, that's fine. I'm that's not going to get mad at someone for liking Twilight any more than I am, like, loving Rachel <laughs> Hollis. Right? Rachel Hollis speaks to a very certain, a very... And she knows her demographic. Yeah. And she doesn't pretend to cater to anyone outside of that demographic, which is a very privileged demographic. Yeah. But she do, what she doesn't do is acknowledge her privilege. Yeah. Um, so it's one thing. If, you, if you're like... If, like, when I said the other night in the stream, like, look, I don't train anyone... That I'm aware of that works second shift at a factory. Yeah. I worked second shift at a factory in high school. So, like, I'm sensitive to it. But if I yeah. knew that I had one, the second I know I have one, I, I change the way yeah. that I cue things. So I just get a little... A lot of the self-help books don't acknowledge the demographic. Right. They talk about the universality of the advice they're about to give. Yeah. And that, that's what bothers me about yeah. that. Because I'm like, you know... If you're not throwing out some some basics and working from there, then you're making a lot of assumptions that might not hold. And then yeah. when the advice doesn't work, I assume the problem is me. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. So I didn't mean to hijack. I'm just like, no, I'm, you didn't I'm hijack. With, I'm with you. No. Um, but I will say that, that this is a solid read so far. Uh, and I think that there's some good stuff. There is a little bit of um, prescriptiveness to this. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Where it's sort of like, this is what's wrong, um, and the end. Um, so, like, it talks... So, this third chapter, which I thought was very helpful, um, getting off the roller coaster really examines diet culture. Yeah. Um, and the kind of all or nothing... You know, food dogma, this food group, this macro is terrible, it's demonized, get rid of it. Yeah. But I've also, I'm going to invoke another <clears throat> self-help book here uh, that I actually did like, okay. which is Gretchen Rubin's book on how yeah. it's yeah. better than before. Did you, have you read that? I have read that. Um, and, I mean, she makes an important distinction between abstainers and moderators. Absolutely. So for some people, I mean, if you're an abstainer, Maybe that works for you. I mean, I haven't met anybody yet who say like who cut, cut carbs for a lifetime and was able to. Practice but there that, are some people that will only use that framework to approach things, and if you can't get them to use a different framework, yeah, then that's how you what you have to how you have to speak to them. But again, fucking acknowledge that in the fucking book that you wrote. Right. Right. So I I thought this was a solid you know so far so far so good is what I can probably say. So I haven't really gotten into too much of like the nitty gritty there's a lot of self-reflection as one does what made you write lol wait oh. <laughs> oh, oh. i just saw lol what did i write the bottom of the page and i'm like i need to know wait I, now i need to know what that was too oh alestra it was a <laughs> i remember that remember alestra? oh my gosh my brain's out did you oh my god but some i didn't know what i i was dry, i was I drank a lot, um, and we we talked about my twenties. They were fraught, um, <laughs> and someone had brought had bought. Um, they'd gone to the Navy base because that's what life was like in Japan. At one point, like you wanted to make friends with sailors that would come to Rapungi so that you could go shop at the commissary and get American food. Okay, because there just wasn't much American food in, yeah. early, in the early aughts. Like Hagen does it just arrived and it was like amazing, amazing. But I I wanted Doritos. At the time. So this is pre-diet, pre-celiac diagnosis. I wanted Puffy Cheetos and I wanted Doritos, both of which you could purchase made from oleo. And I remember 
like being so excited because I met the, the right guy that didn't like creep me out too much and I'm, I'm going to the base and I buy all the stuff from the commissary and I bring it back home and of course I'm like drinking that night with a whole bunch of people and then it happened and we were like Wait, I have, were you with the cute guy when no, no. the Alestra like no, I was a I was a mess girl I was okay. a mess girl like they like after spending like a small amount of time with me you, 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 people didn't people didn't okay. stay and that's fair unless they were just as much of a mess as I as okay. I am so um so yeah, when the when the people that were with us that were drinking and dr- and eating the Doritos and playing poker, when it all sort of like hit the pot, wow! So yes, I remember Alistair. Alistair. I think we call that Oleo. I don't know. I just remember you could like eat a whole tin of Pringles and it was like guilt free, but then it was except until he your gut. Until then, and then it was like watch out. Amazing. Yeah. So I was like Alistair. I remember Alistair. Lol. So. <laughs> I got nostalgic. Memories. I got nostalgic <laughs> about the diarrhea days. Fantastic. All in the name of like weight loss, right? Right. The things yeah. you do, it's like, but but the way they described it as well, it was like there could be some side effects, like heart palpitations, and I think they said anal leakage. Did they say anal? Le- no, they probably wouldn't have, because that's not very marketing. I mean, friendly. at the time, I didn't have to read labels. So yeah. if it said anal leakage, I would have kept that shit out and drank it. <laughs> I don't remember. I honestly don't remember. Anal leakage. Anal leakage. Probably not real, real helpful in the marketing department. You know what? People might not have cared. I probably saw it. Yeah. Care. I mean, Pringles. I don't are, remember. Pringles are delicious. Pringles are amazing. So. Did you see that woman that got arrested in the Walmart parking lot? For Texas? drinking. Out of the pr- drinking wine Pringles. out of the Pringles can. I'm yeah. like, Vanessa. One of my clients was in Texas that week, so I was like. Was this you? Was this you? It's amazing. It was not, unfortunately. That that's an amazing story. That is amazing. Drinking wine out of a Pringles can. I mean, there, there's putting Dolly Parton taught us all in Tennessee how to put peanuts in your Coke because you want the salt. I, mean, I need the salt information. Sweet. If you put it in, it only works in a glass bottle. It don't work in the can, and it only works with full fat Coke and that diet nonsense. Okay. And when you take like the some them planters peanuts and you just yeah. dump them in a bottle of Coke, it tastes amazing. All the salt and sugar mixes and just ooh, it's good. Okay, that it's like simultaneously bubble. sounds disgusting and wonderful to me. It's like a real trash version of bubble tea. What is bubble tea? You haven't had bubble tea? What is that? It's the it's the Korean drink. They no. they there's there's a bubble tea place down the street. There's like a specific place for bubble tea? Yes. It's a thing. Yeah, they have those little those little salty bubbles at the bottom of a very sweet tea drink. And they give you the big fat straw so you can set the bubbles up. What? Korean bubble tea. We're, We're learning like, everything here tonight on Googling, the stream. Googling, Googling Korean bubble tea. Korea, what what place is this? It's not platform tea because they closed, it's, it's, right? It's called Korean bubble tea. Korean bubble tea. It's the name of the store. Okay. See, I moved out of the neighborhood and everything good comes. I guess they don't have that in Stapleton. Boo hoo. We don't. We don't. <laughs> We don't have Korean bubble tea. Oh, well. They have it in Philadelphia. Okay. Anyway. Oh, Bento. Wait, yeah, there are like specific places showing up here. Yes. Refresh Lolly Cup? Oh, yes. Bento? Yes. Snow Lab? Yeah. You're missing out. And this is good? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Sweet and savory all at the same time. All right. I don't like sweet tea. You would like this. I would like it. Okay. Yeah, because you're getting the salty bubbles up in the sweetness. Okay. All right. It's like a one-stop shop for your time. Yes, basically. Okay. Is anyone saying anything about it in the chat? <gasps> yes. So, uh, oh, so about the bookshelves. If you scroll down, you'll see they're built on angles so you can climb them. See, this is what I need in my life. Yes. Right? Because currently I climb and there's a strong chance of, like, you know, I need to child-proof my bookshelves for myself. Amazing. Also have to pay over bedtime. Thanks. Somebody, okay, we're getting a lot of bubble tea endorsements here. I love it. I'm telling you, bubble tea is the best. Tapioca balls? Yes! What are those? That's that's what the balls are. The salty balls at the bottom. (laughs) Salty balls at the bottom of the sweet tea. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. My daughter's gymnastics. I signed up for this messaging system and it is... What about gymnastics? It's like a tyranny of messages on my phone. Okay. So, anyway. 
Try not to laugh at you. Okay. <laughs> Now hold on to the chat since we can't see it. From okay, the tapioca balls. We <laughs> salty balls. We love bubble tea. Bubble tea is awesome. Okay, bubble tea is awesome. I am last to know. Hashtag last to know for all things. We are just gonna we're gonna have to have another stream where we take Erica out of Stapleton <laughs> and show her things that don't happen in the suburbs. I don't want to leave. Every city says Stapleton. City says so <laughs> How many things there? <gasps> I didn't want to move there, but now that I'm there. I, you know, I can understand that. I hear it's, you know, it's, I no one ever wanted to leave wherever it was as Shepherd Wild lived either, so, yeah. it's fair. Okay, so do you have more to say about your zebra book? I do, and it's funny that we're talking about this today. Um, when I, we, I should have probably just, like, started the stream whenever um, Erica showed up at my doorstep, because, so, one of my, one of my, one of my two remaining one-on-one <laughs> -on -one private clients um, ran... The Houston Marathon this morning, and this is the first pre-run conversation that uh, was was borderline disastrous, and it wasn't like yelling and screaming because that's not me and it's not him. Um, but he'd been sick for ten days, and he yeah. this is the first training cycle where he had done all the things. Like I'm looking at his run, and I'm like, "Did you do that? Did you do the one two punch, the high knees, and the accelerators at the end?" <clears throat> and he would say yes, and I'm like. Because he's honest. Like, he, if he hadn't done it, and that had been our previous two training cycles, did you do this and this? No. And I probably won't. Okay. Doesn't hurt me. I'm not the one with the goal. Yeah. But so for when um, he'd been doing all the things, all the things this time, um, with with a couple of slips, and all of this is happening, like, while my, my final two, my last day is at, with the fundraising blitz was happening. So he wasn't at the front of my mind because I'm like, this is going to, if, if, I'm, if I say something, I'm going to blow it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like, he has not done this before, so I'm just going to, like, keep watching and hope that it continues. But if I say anything, trying to, to, to like, make the win, keep, you know, if I so much as it, it, it encourage it, it's all going to end. Right. Yeah. So I just kept doing what I was doing and, like, watching from over here and not saying very much, only, like, when directly asked questions. And then, um, then he got sick, and he was really dehydrated going, um, like, yeah. he was sick, he sick. was sick, sick, like, and when he would say, when he says, I would, I have this tummy issues, that either means explosive diarrhea, or it means massive cramping, and by massive cramping, he, some, he can, like, cramping, like, the worst period cramps that you like, can't, like, function, like, yeah, like, I remember um, someone saying to me, one of his care providers saying to me, because I coordinate all that behind the scenes, I remember one of them saying to me, I don't know how he was standing up. Um, and I'm like, well, he went for a run. They were like, you made him run like that. I'm like, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. He, he said it wasn't that bad. So all that just to say that, like, I'm, I'm gaming this out the night before. His numbers had been, in, had been tanking because... That's all I have to go by, right? So it's like I can't 100% trust what someone tells me because they're going to tell me that they're better than they actually are because they want to be better than they actually right, are. Right, right. They want to be fine. Denial is a powerful drug. It, it is, but it's also not wanting to be weak. Like yeah. that because we don't – there's the way we talk about pain is really messed up. That's like true. it's all in your head and yeah. we don't give it to each other. And it's like That's just true. tough it up a little bit and you'll be okay. Yeah. And yeah. it's like – but that, that doesn't work if it's my job to, to help guide you through a thing. Yeah. Um, so, and le long story short, I, I look at my husband, and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Alex is like, what are the numbers saying? I'm like, he's he, before he got sick, he was, he was, the conversation we were going to have was, are you truly ready for a 237? Because, like, if you, everything's going to have to lock in, and it would be about locking in. That, that's the conversation I was, I was ready to have before yeah. this happened. And then Alex was like, what did you do for New York? And I'm like, well, that's what I did for New York. He's like, all right, we'll do the opposite of what you did for New York. I'm like, why? He's like, you need to prepare him. And this is Alex, your husband. Alex, my husband, who has listened to me coach very patiently in the background for how five, five, six years now. Yeah. And he knows what I was saying in a lot of situations. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. I sure as hell don't want to be the bearer, bearer of bad news when this guy's already in Houston. Yeah. But um, Alex was like, well, you thought things would be better than they were in New York, and then we had to go figure out why it wasn't better Yeah. afterwards. How about we just say, hey, I, 
you you're compromised. Yeah. 248. 248 would be terrific as compromised as you are. If you had to put a number on it, how compromised is he? I would say if it doesn't get worse, he's he's operating at 90%. So yeah. the question will then be, what percentage of 90% is he going to be able to capitalize on tomorrow? And then that gets into probabilities I can't calculate that are all going to go out the window if his newborn daughter that's in the same hotel room as he is doesn't sleep through the night or you know, he, the, the, the GI stuff represents, there are so many things that could go wrong. I'm scared to put a number on this. Yeah. And Alex is like, well, just do the opposite of what you did from New York and hope for the best. What's a number that would be a PR, but he wouldn't be happy with? I was like, 248. He'd be, he'd be so pissed if I get on the phone and say 248. And Alex is like, well, that's what you say. What had been his PR before this race? Two, like, like 248 and, and change. Okay. So yeah. It would be like it would be a PR, but it'd but be like, like barely Yay! A you PR. did everything right, and you get a fifteen second PR is the yeah. hard because okay. it sucks. He had done everything, and then he gets sick. Yeah. So I, I I I get on the phone. I I, I think about calling J Row, but I don't have time because DJ's waiting for the call. So I'm like, I'm just gonna get, I'm gonna I'm gonna be fired. He's gonna fire me. He's gonna curse at me. He's gonna fire me. It's fine. It's okay. So I'm like making peace with that. And I call him, and he was mad. Yeah. He was really disappointed. Like, if you had told me this two days ago, I wouldn't have gone. I was like, yeah. if you had, if we had spoken two days ago, I would have told you not to go. Yeah. But your numbers are still rising. What I saw this morning in your in your shakeout run wasn't terrible. So he's like, well, I've got a plan, and this is my plan, and you're going to hate the plan, but this is what I intend to do. And I'm like, no one, that's fine with me. No one can judge the situation other than you. Yeah. Like, mom, hi. How are you? How was your hamburger? Good. Is it amazing? Yeah. Can you say hi to Miss Erica? Hi. Hello. Can you say hi to everyone here on camera? Hi. There you go. Somebody said they had bubble tea in Tokyo. <gasps> Everybody has had bubble tea. Except you. Living in Stapleton. I'm just saying we got to get you out for a little bit. Hi. Hi. God, let's go take a bath. I love you. Big. I know. They're really nice, right? <laughs> Bye, sweetheart. I love you. I love you. She was like the savior of all the disaster that was their attempt to ski today. So, so, so DJ, so DJ was bad at me. I accepted that, but it's called it's called bracing in sports in sports science, um, sports psychology. Like yeah. I, I say this to you as though you you know you would have learned about this okay. in the prison system. I, right? No, I took one course in sports psychology. It's now like a whole program. Actually, the guy who lives across my, the street from me, like, runs the program. Oh, really? Yeah, I do. It's amazing. Yeah. So he knows a lot more than I do. But he might have written that article then. There was one that came in my Nuzzle newsletter. It was either last week or this week, but it talks about bracing as a concept. If you if you address the worst and brace yourself for it, okay, then that you're not, by denying that this the worst could happen, that's not real, then you're not prepared for it and you've made it okay. worse. Okay. So you've actually worsened the worst case scenario because you weren't prepared to manage that thing. Okay. So if we talk about the things that you bracing is the idea of, if we talk about the things that you could be managed so that there are no surprises once you've started, yeah. then we can improve the outcome. Okay. And uh, I was like, well, we're just, I'm just going to brace him for a 248. Yeah. He got mad. We didn't sleep. Woke up. I was like, text me in the morning and let me know how your gut is, how you're feeling. I got a text at 5.35 a.m. saying, it's bad. I expect to drop my mind. It'll be okay. Three hundred two forty one. Marathon. Crazy. Marathon. He, the numbers that I had seen the day before indicated he was capable of a 237. The statistical probability of a 237 happening was none. The question is how far behind that ball is he going to be? I don't know. I mean, if the gut kicks in, if the, the dehydration and the muscle cramping yeah. starts, he could have a Charlie horse. He'd have a really tight Achilles that we had to go get dry nailed a couple days ago. If that presents again, he could be out of mile nine. Carrie Goucher dropped him. Oh, I saw. I saw that. Until what? Like Everyone mile feels 16 or something? 19. 19. 18, and then she knew I could keep it going. Like and I'd be walking it in. And it's not what I want. Hi, baby. Oh, my gosh, she's so bad. I love you. Hi. And I love you too, Daddy. So I know she's in the in the bam bam hair. Oh my god. God. Anyway, sorry. 
That's my, my, my husband with my, my people and strapped his chest just walked in. Um, so, I, yeah, all that just to say that, like, when we, um, I, as soon as, I was not expecting this. There's no way I could have. Yeah. I love being wrong. I wanted this for him. Yeah. Like, everyone likes to forget these moments that I'm actually here to be your advocate, too. I wanted this for him. And what, what, what Alex pointed out was, is this is the first time you've, you have, he has entertained the idea that this might not be what I want it to be. The last time we had something similar was Boston Marathon for him, which he was, he'd been having similar issues, mm -hmm. but he was like, I will finish it. I'm finishing it's Boston. It's important. Yeah. I will not, I will finish this race if I have to crawl. And then he did. Uh, I made a 4.15 to him. It's crawling, but he was walking a lot and sitting at one point. So not, not, not his best day. Wasn't the best. But he even he we I was like you really don't need to go that was not an option you need to not participate not an option this is the first time okay I'm already there I don't have to I don't have to do this yeah if there was the, the mantra I don't have to do this yeah it was the first time it was his I'm just gonna start because I'm already here and we'll see what happens and if I feel bad I'm not gonna push it past mile eleven and he just kept going and he kept getting stronger so that did you say he he had a yeah, half my time PR in the second half. In the second half. And it's and I pretty very I sure it's a breath away from a 10 PR. And Houston is not that's not a PR course. I mean, it's not it's it, the course is not the problem. It's, it's the weather. The weather, it's the pollen and the humidity. And it sucks. Yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> we have we we're trying to be we didn't we have not we, I have I have had only heartbreak at Houston and Chicago. And there are two that I just don't like sending runners to with the PR in their head. Unless the last time they raced, they were their fitness level is just so drastically different mm. that a PR is a given. Yeah. You know? It's it's for someone like like DJ, I would I would be like, okay, you're doing this. Okay. Yeah. Like I can't. So all that just to say that what the whole idea behind why zebras don't get ulcers, back to that, is that if you can't manage stress. And you don't have a way to come out of it. This might have been the first time his stress was totally managed. He dealt, he braced, he got, he made, I don't want to say made peace with it because I don't think he really had. Yeah. But he it, but he went into that event with the idea that I don't have to do this. Like, we, we've always talked about those ejection points yeah. where if it's not working, you know, have your wife wait here, then have your wife wait here, and they can take you away in the car. And, like, he's never... You elected to use them for. He was fully prepared at the first time he saw Carrie to, to get in the car and leave. Hmm. And we didn't have to do it. So, so I will say one thing I learned in my one semester of sports yeah. psychology in that one class, because there was only one class back then. It wasn't a whole program. And it was very trendy at the time in the school of um, professional psychology, I think. It was like the PsyD program. Uh -huh. um, which was sort of adjacent to my program at the time, was this idea of acceptance and commitment therapy. Have you ever heard of this? Yeah. Yeah. So it, the idea is that instead of like fighting with or rejecting or avoiding those things that we're afraid of. Yeah, like I'm sick and I'm compromised. Right. You're sick that, and you're compromised, let's deal. You might not finish. Right. That you then accept those things and keep going. Yeah. Because evidence shows that a lot of times if you're trying to, like, argue internally with negative messages that you get. Yes, right? which and he does. And the inner critic is, I mean, that's powerful. And actually there is reference to the inner critic in this book. Kudos to the um, authors here. Um, the inner critic is really powerful and really, really toxic, right? The inner critic is that voice that tells us that we suck. I mean, that's why I have the mantra. It's like, you know, I want to be in your ear frequently enough yeah. with my podcast that, like, I tell you specifically what to shout back at that voice. Morning mantra, the toxic person in me. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> it's true. So, yeah, I mean, it is. It's a very toxic, it is. It's a toxic yeah. message and a toxic person inside. It's that voice that tells you you suck, you're, you're imposter, terrible, you belong, you're, you're imposter, you don't Everybody belong, hates you, you here. have no friends. Yes, but instead of being like, shut up, voice. Because when you like tell that voice to shut up, in some ways it makes it louder. Yeah. And it, um, it feeds the voice. Yeah. That accepting the voice and moving on and recognizing the voice and being like, like a narcissist. Yeah. This is a challenge. Yeah. That you like recognize the voice and then you keep going. And yeah. so this sounds very kind of ACT to me. That 
there was like, here's the worst case scenario. Okay, that's what it is. And then he did it anyway. Well, he was like, what's my best case scenario? And I said a 248. Which you said was his heartbreak, right? It was like the 15 second fever. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's like your body, I didn't think you, every step you take, you're making a bet. And if I had told him, because we've done this before, you were fitter than you think you are, trust me, and here's a strategy. Yeah. And he was like, you know, and it's not about right or wrong, it just didn't come together. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know, I can't tell him t- you're going to run a 240 anything or a 237. Like, the best you were possibly capable of, capable of right now with all things being perfect is a 237. But that's not going to happen. Now what? A 241? Yeah. If I'm wrong and he's trying to run a 241, what if it should have been a 243? That means he's going to be walking at some point. So I don't... No, I didn't know what the worst... The, to me, the worst case scenario is he has a great day and fires me anyway. <laughs> you know? So, because right. I want him to have what he wants. But, right. like, knowing that my cue is, is going to guide his mentality going out there. So that's why I came with 248. Your best you can hope for is 248. He's like, really? I'm like, it's not your fitness. I just, it's hard to know how compromised you are. Yeah. So that was what I did, ACT. You did ACT. I did ACT. Yeah. I did some, I, I've adulted. <laughs> I psychology. As long as it's not the post office. Here's yeah. Fun. I'm, you know, I've got, so that, all that stuff finally went out. And thank you everyone for posting pictures of it so I have proof that I adulted and did the post office and did the mail. But now, Karen Sutton is supposed to get, I, I, I elected to give her, Honey, because she seems like one of those oh. types that would be like, oh, you, yeah, you know, very earthy. Yeah. Um, natural honey yeah. from the area helps you get over allergies I've heard because that. you're yeah. ingesting. Yeah, that's what everyone told me when I came here. They're like, you need to eat natural honey. I know yeah. a guy. I know a guy. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I know a guy. I know a guy. With the honey, <laughs> really? Who has like bees in his backyard? Because everyone has yeah. bees in their backyard. That's it's true. Crazy. That's true. Um, so yeah. Anyway, I, I saw my I, neighbor. Had bees. I had a conversation like this that for some reason made me think of something Karen had put on a Facebook page that day. And I was like, you get in the honey, Karen. She's way you healthier the than I am. She's very, well, I mean, she's just, I mean, I don't want to say hippie because that sounds derogatory, but, you know, this, she's just her. It's just earth mama type. Yeah. So I buy it and I take it to the, and, you know, not, I forget she lives in England because I had all this written down. And to, um, shipping honey to England is neither cheap nor acceptable. Oh, because, because it's, it's like, it's practically medicine. So, no. so yeah. Like that? Well, I mean, like once we started talking about the honey and why I was sending it to her, it was it. it I should have kept my mouth shut. So, I've got so and Lisa and and Tamara in Canada. Um, I had their box of stuff, and I had Karen's thing. So I get there, I get all the shipping done with like three gigantic bags because I'm an idiot, and I get all of those bags. I get everything off. We save these two for last. It was going to cost 50 bucks to send this box to Canada. And I'm like, Lisa, Tamara, I love you. No. And then with Karen, they just wouldn't let me. So I'm like, so I've repacked these boxes now. And they might get to their destinations before three days at the fair. <laughs> They're boxed. We'll see. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I, I was, um, I felt vindicated that you hate the post office. Because I hate the post office. I hate yeah. it. I don't know why. Like, at work, they'll be like, we're gonna do secret Santas, and everybody, we're gonna do, like, cookies, and go to the post office and send cookies. I'm like, if it involves the post office, it is not happening. Yeah, I will order you something from Amazon. Totally. And we'll have it shipped to your house. But if I have to go to the post office, like, why would you? So when you were like, I hate the post office, I was like, which is, yes. which is ironic, right? Because, like, I offered to do this. And then yeah. I offer, I'm like, Christmas cards are my jam. And everybody and their mother gets Christmas cards from me. And there were, and people were like, and they hey, were amazing. Will you send them? Thank you. Yours were too, though. It was really, we have, we have the best photographer. Um, I buy all these people, like, the shop, the sheer number of international cards I sent this year. So we had, we sent, like, something like 675 cards, which is ridiculous. Just a few. There are, like, 30 of them were international. And I don't mean, like, Canada. I mean, like, across. Yeah, so I was, I, sh- I just didn't expect it, and I don't mind it, but then I forgot when I show up, I'm like, I was doing my, the strength challenge while I'm like yeah. putting all the envelopes together. Did you come back? Um, well, I forgot that I had to turn around, and then I'm like, I'm staring at the box, and I'm like, oh, oh I've got to go get an international stamp. I've got to stand in the line. These I think are that's gonna, the problem is the line. It's, and, and the parking. I hate yeah. the parking. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I have to park 
and then you have to walk inside. I yes. mean, I'm like, surely I can really pay someone to come pick them up from my house. Some. Yeah. So That's all the terrible. international cards went out with all the with all the gifts. I'm not proud. Really late. I'm not. It is what it is. Kind of like you know, we've been talking for two hours and we still haven't talked about the book that we haven't read. Yes. Hi, Cheyenne. That's it. <laughs> oh, that seems just belated. I love her. And our faces are frozen. Oh, it's because I'm not playing it. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, yeah, I, it's well, not quite two hours. It's like an hour and 15 right. minutes. Anyway, I'm glad we can bond over our shared hatred of the post office. Me too. Should I talk more about what this book is about? We should. We okay. should. Because this book is, I'm just saying, I've been living some of the things in uh, Yeah, you've been in having here. some stress. I've been having some stress. It's amazing I didn't get ulcers um, overnight because it's like, you know, it's not like I'm, a, I'm, if I do my job correctly, then I'm a footnote in the story, right? Yeah. So if I do my job poorly, I am the story. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So no one ever gives credit to a coach when things go well, and that's okay. They credit their wife who made it possible for them to train. They credit their manager who let them out of work early. They credit everyone that made the training possible. They don't, they're, I maybe they'll remember to tag me in the picture, but they're not like, this is you. You know what I mean? If yeah. it's bad, it's it you. is my fault. Yeah. 100%. It's the plan. It's that I didn't believe. It's that I didn't push you. It's that I didn't, I didn't. It's always me. If it's bad, if it's good, you know, I'm in, I'm in the background. So, it's that that's the pressure I live with. It's like, how invisible am I gonna? If I, am I gonna be visible today? I know. It's like, <laughs> but then that that's where my ulcers come from. So anyway, this this book is worth reading, for sure. It has you probably won't, which is why it's part of. I added it to the list, and so let, let's sort of not talk Holy about shit. it. Are yep. these all like? Yep. Oh, but these, you know, all footnotes? these are footnotes. So you've got three hundred. No. Yeah, you've got 418 pages of text, and then you've got 150 pages of footnotes. Which, again, is not a bad thing. It's very thoroughly researched. Yeah. But that's 400 pages. You got that's it right. very entertaining that goes through all parts of the body. If you've got this book in your hand, the things that you will find interesting and relevant, especially if you've trained with me at any point, it would be chapter, skim through chapter one, very, through, Read chapter one, skim chapter two, where it talks about hormones. You've heard me talk about those before too, right? Fight or flight, homeostasis, your body tries to, yeah. and if you've been overtraining and your heart rate's too high and it's too prolonged, then your body's producing cortisol um, because it thinks you're running away from a lion. All of the whys as to like, and hey, I want the science and the data, it's in chapter two. <laughs> God, if you couldn't handle Phil Maffetone's explanation, then go to Sadowski's, who doesn't even talk about training at all. But he talks about the pituitary gland and how it can be overstressed to the point that it becomes non-functional. And that it's possible through exercise. Um, and then he talks about cardiac disease, heart attacks, strokes, and voodoo death, which is all chapter three. And each chapter, by the way, is super short. Each chapter is like 15 pages. So read oh, the first right. three chapters. Um, he, in chapter four is stress metabolism and liquidating your assets. Um, what is and, liquidating your assets? Um, I was just about talking about putting energy in the tank and depleting it. So oh, okay. if you have the time and the headspace, but this is very dense. This is where the chapters start to get very dense. And you might not have touchstones in your life or in your day-to-day -day yeah. that make top, topics like DHA easy to digest and relevant. If you do, yay for you, but, you know, I, with all of this say, like, I love data and science, I'm a smarty pants and smarty smarty, and that's true until you've done your job all day, worked, done one of my training plans, had your, like, mommed, adulted, gone to the post office, and then you come home. You just want to read 50 Shades of Grey. At 9 o'clock, you want to read 50, you want to watch 50 Shades of Grey and fall asleep. <laughs> you don't want to live it, you don't want to read it, and you don't want to do it. Just saying. That sounds about right. So it doesn't make you a dummy for not wanting to read that. Just yeah. saying there are very le legit reasons why a book might sit on your shelf, none of which has to do with you being stupid, but all of which has, has to do with you being a little bit overtaxed. Yeah. So she talks about metabolic syndrome, talks about immunity, um, and not to say that the rest isn't fantastic. It really is. Um, but 
the immune the immunity the stress and diseases i love the chapter about pain that's chapter nine mm -hmm. and the the pain perception but this is where um neuroscience intersects heavily with psychology and what you've been trained to manage and what you've been allowed to do or feel um there's a whole conversation my friend is married to um, a conservative commentator um and he was on msnbc the other day talking about um, whether or not it's okay to tell children to tough it up um, he okay. rejects the idea of toxic masculinity uh, like not he doesn't deny that it exists yeah he just says um, he's a little more nuanced in that he's an attorney okay. and he'll say things like mm, you know it can be used for forces of good yeah and here's an example and then it gets attacked I'm like, I hope they pay it really well to go and get beat up on MSNBC all the time. That is like, whew, it's just hard to watch. Yeah. Uh, but like, toughen up is a really great example of that, where someone says, "I'm in pain," and then like a ch one of our children because they don't want to do something, and we right. say, "Toughen up," and we're denying that the pain exists. Which is not to say that like you don't want to say that to your kids, or that you shouldn't say that to your kids. But it's you're sh you're when you say something like, "Toughen up," you're cutting off the conversation. Yeah. And as a society, we've not been willing to have conversations about pain. Ever because you can't quantify it, you can't measure it. It varies from person to person. The same event might make um, might cause a pain of twelve in you and a, a seventeen in me on right. a scale of ten. So, and there's no way to predict it ahead of time. How much is if there's no way to separate it? So he talks about stress and pain and how they interact um, in the brain. And yeah, no, it's 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 very interesting. He doesn't um, he doesn't come. He doesn't give like a whole lot of like stress management tips, which I think is what people wanted. But for, as a coach, when I'm giving cues and I'm talking to someone in a very stressful situation, um, what is the what can I do that will provide the least stressful channel? Yeah. Um, so if you work in a place where you have to give cues, like a physical therapist, no one ever does their physical therapy work except me. Um, Al Stein told me to go five days a week. I go, I go eight. I go, I go eight, I go seven, and two hours on Wednesday. So, do you um, really? I do. I'm there eight hours a week. And then two hours on top of that doing strength stuff now. Oh my God. I know that's my normal. You yep. are. Rehab is my part time job. You are a good client. I don't want to hurt anymore. I don't ever want to go back in bed again. I'm a, I'm a, I didn't get to hold the last baby that's going to come out of my yeah. busted body. Like, I'm, just, I'm a little bit better. Yeah. So now I'm, do, I'm not going to, I would rather. If I'm doing the work, when something goes wrong, it's not my fault. I get to yell at the coach. Obviously, I'm coming for you. Yeah, so, <laughs> and, uh, and the, the final chapter that I Ooh. would highlight, yep, uh, it's stress and depression. And you can pick and choose. It's better to kind of move your way through the book because all the concepts sort of build on top yeah. of each other. You could read this one in isolation. Um, we are morbidly fascinated with the exotica of disease. They feel are made for television movies or tabloids, and the book reports of adolescents hoping to become a doctor someday. Victorians with elephant man disease, murderers with multiple personality disorders, 10-year-olds with progeria, idiot savants with autism, cannibals with kudu. Who could resist? But when it comes to the bread and butter of human misery, try major depression. It can be life-threatening. It can destroy lives, demolish the families of sufferers, and it, has a diz and it is dizzyingly common uh, Martin Seligman has called it the common cold of psychopathology. Best estimates are that uh, from 5 to 20 percent of us will suffer a major incapacitating depression at some point in our lives, causing us to be hospitalized or medicated or non-functional for a significant length of yeah. time. Its incidence has been steadily increasing for decades. By the year 2020, depression is projected to be the second leading cause of medical disability on Earth. I believe it. I mean, mental health issues are the leading cause of disability in the United States. Yeah. It's a $200 billion problem for people who don't go untreated. Yeah. I know that. I just gave a training the other day. <laughs> it's like, wait a <laughs> minute. The statistics are like, was that in there too? No, it was not in here. But suicide is also the 10th leading cause of death in the, in the United States and the second leading cause of death for people between the ages of 10 and 34. Oh, my God. I have all the stats. I have all of them. I love it. Well, what he, what, 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 the reason that I like this book so much to, to kind of wrap up why you should grab it, skim it, or hold on to it by the summary and not read it, um, if it's been sitting next to your, next to your bed for, for a while, like it did mine, I didn't actually, this has been next to my bed for almost a year, um, it's, it's, it's not that it's hard to read, 
Um, I actually find books like this that are well written and interesting. They're easy to skim. Yeah. Like The Martian. I was describing The Martian to my friend. Mm. Um, it is very math heavy, and I like math, but I'm not like my I'm not a nuclear physicist like my husband that like likes math on a very different level. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a situation. <sighs> and then he does math. Math, 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 math. And then it's a situation. And then he does math, 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 math. And he does like pages and pages yeah. of complex calculations. So this is kind of like reading The Martian. It, it, you look at it and it's daunting and it sits there, but once you pick it up, you just skim through the math parts where they really go deep into the science because if you do this as your day job, you probably don't need to know about how DHA recombines in the brain. Um, and if you don't do this as your day job, you don't give a shit. So just skip through it and get back to the part where he's telling the story real good. Because yeah. a lot of it will resonate. And the, um, what the, the, if, there was, if I had to put this into like a mantra and a tagline, the problem's not you. The problem is the way the, the conversations that we've been shutting down as a society, it's not you. Yeah. So if you need reinforcement that it's not you, why zebras don't get ulcers, we tend to uh, like posit it as, well, zebras don't get ulcers, and they've got a really stressful life. You don't deserve to be stressed out. It's like, well, not you helpful. know, you also, it's not helpful. It's not validating. Mm -mm. And it's, it, like zebras don't have to pay the rent. Right? They don't have to explain to their kids why you can't afford to participate, why you can't go to you know Harvard even though you got in, we can't afford to send you or right. whatever. Like, I don't know. They There's a different set of problems. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So that's a great book to buy. Do it. Do it. Do it. And another great book to buy. MK, did you send the whole book as a PDF today? Yes, I did. Did you? I did. Wait, that book? Yes. Did I get it? I put it. I posted the link in the in the Facebook group. Oh. If you RSVP to the event, yay! You've got the whole book, but you would have to print it out and then highlight it. So yeah, you can have it, but then again, having it and having it to to have and to hold is a very different concept. So you could you could highlight it, put little flags in it like I do. Okay. So. Well, that was really nice of you. Thank you. I did not do that for my book. <laughs> Mindfulness. Um. Just. I don't know if people know about mindfulness. Um, I think it probably, they actually do not jump into the idea of mindfulness in this book, at okay. least in the intro. Are you familiar with mindfulness? I mean, I mean, you've done like Headspace. Yes, I do Headspace. I, I do. do. I mean, if you've done Headspace, then you have a pretty good grasp on what mindfulness is, right? Yeah. Being in the yeah. moment. Yeah. Um, Without shame in, in those moments where you can't. Exactly, right? Yeah. You're not, it's like, it's a, it's a, position of non-striving yeah so you, where you're not trying to change anything you're not judging it um which is really uh i think countercultural for us right it is because we're so we we and, and, and again i say this to somebody that was abroad from 2000 until 2007 and i there i've said quite the one thing that has been constant is that the country i came back to was not the one that I'd left behind. And, and at first... Is that what, true or was it you? Oh, it's so true. Well, that's what people would say to me. They're like, oh, no, it's just you. You grew. You're older. Your perspective has changed. I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. No. Things are really different. Um, one thing that we do celebrate now in a bigger, bigger way, you didn't want kids to be siloed and too focused. You wanted them to be as well-rounded yeah. As, oh, he likes science a little bit too much. Make sure he does a painting class or he'll never get into Harvard because Harvard wants well-rounded. Well-rounded, being mm -hmm. at everything and not really being good at anything because you just needed to be um, better than the mean. Yeah. But you didn't need to be two standard deviations better in anything. If that, yeah. That's one way of looking at it. I mean, not, we, no one ever put it quite that eloquently. Do everything. Don't worry if you're if you're excellent or not because the more you do, the less excellent you have to be. And that's you, how you can have an after. And now when I came back, it's like oh, you're expected to have had a laser like focus on what it is you do and why with no deviation from age two. And it's like okay for an Olympic athlete, yeah, yeah. I love that Misty Copeland broke that paradigm for everyone. She the the the, the ballerina. Yeah, yeah. She didn't start until she was almost thirteen, like which is super late. Um, but all, all that just to say that, like, yeah, I, I, I practice mindfulness. It is very countercultural. It's interesting that it's coming back into the fold now. Yeah. And I think it's amazing that we're finally starting to talk about the connection between the stress you feel. 
because I can't tell you how many athletes don't want to think about food. They don't want to mm. think about food. They don't want to talk about food. They don't want to have the discussion. They just, there are good foods and there are bad foods. My diet's fine. I don't eat bad foods. That is yeah. it. And it's like, mm, but are you getting enough protein? You're a vegan. And I'm not saying, you hate vegans. Like, no, I was a vegan. Yeah. I was a vegan for a long time. I have nothing against vegans. I'm not one anymore. What I'm saying is, you're projecting. I'm not projecting. <laughs> I'm not projecting. I'm saying, you know what I mean? Like, there yeah. are people, if we shut it down and we, it's, I, I wouldn't, and I don't want to be so gross as to say that it's like we're in denial. But yeah. it's like, I've never had a conversation like that where people prove themselves right. I, I hear you and I understand vegans are known to be deficient in B vitamins and protein. Let me give you an example of what I just ate. That conversation doesn't come and I'm just like, when it doesn't happen and people shut down and get defensive, it's like, uh oh. But we don't, it's not just mm-hmm. vegans. People do this about any specialized diet. I've been celiac for 10 years. I still get snippy when people are like, really? I'm like, bitch. <laughs> I had a cold biopsy. You know, like, yeah. But we, we just don't know how to talk about food and weight and diet and choices. And it's right. in a healthy manner. That's right. And the way it is about food. That's why I said from the beginning, I'm not talking. We had a lot of people coming into AMR that were like, I'm paying you all this money for heart rate training. I expect answers about nutrition. I'm like, nope. It is firmly outside of my scope. I do not ever want to have that conversation with anyone. Go talk to Ellie. Yeah. You can't talk to her that way. Yeah. No one can yell at Ellie. Oh, Ellie's yeah. She's the best. Yeah. And I think that that's part of what is really helpful, especially about this third chapter, which is where it really examines how we talk about food, how we think about food, and how... Not only unhelpful it is, but how kind of counterproductive it is. Yeah. Um, one thing that this author, isn't it Ruth? Ruth and Beth and Tanya. One thing that they reference is this kind of cycle that we get into. They reference this sort of black and white thinking, right? Where we moralize food. Yeah. It's either good foods or it's bad. It's, un- it's healthy or it's unhealthy. I'm on the wagon or I'm not on the wagon. Um, I'm kind of on the diet. <laughs> but that, that black and white thinking is really unhelpful um, because it really, it sets us up because why will, because you, you get on the wagon, right? You're on the wagon. You're eating the healthy food. Do you know how many times people have said to me, you have, you're so lucky you have celiac? What? Right? Because they assume that that means I eat healthy. I have to. You have to eat healthy. There are consequences. I can't fall off the wagon. Interesting. Mm-hmm. It'd be like a lustra. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> you eat gluten, it's like eating a lustra. No, but they talk about this cycle, this failure, shame, avoidance cycle. Yeah. Uh, abstinence violation effect is the term. So That sounds like a class my church would offer when I was in junior high. <laughs> <laughs> abstinence only <laughs> does not work across the board. Because it just <laughs> because it leads to failure, which then leads to shame, and shame is really toxic. Yes. And then you avoid it, right? So why even try again in the future? I feel like we should have watched Tammy Faye Baker special the other night on TV. What was there before. a special about yes. her? Oh my god, yes, about her and her marriage. Okay, all I remember about her is from like her eyelashes. eyelashes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like spider eyelashes. It was on ABC. Um, okay. I didn't. I happened to not catch it, but like now you said abstinence, and I'm not going to be able to. Mm-hmm. And then faith, and then shame, and I'm like, it's like watching that special all over, again. all over again. Oh, Tammy, we're talking about it's the Tammy, Tammy Faye diet plan. Oh my God. You're on the wagon, and then you you fail, and then you are shamed, and the wagon just won't roll, won't run you over, no matter right. how hard you try to jump in front of it. And they talk about these different kinds of styles, right? There's like this anything goes and on one end, right, where you can like do it all and eat it all, right, as much as you want. And then there's like the rules, which is super rigid, like you're all keto, no carbs for you, Mm. which I don't want to judge because it really doesn't work for some people. No, it does. The keto diet exists for, it's like being celiac, right? A, A donut is a donut. If it doesn't have gluten in it, it's still a donut, right? It just happens it's a donut that will poison me if I eat it, Yeah. right? In keto, it's been super helpful for lots of very specific conditions. So I don't know. I'm, I'm very much in the mindset. I'm not convinced that gluten-free is healthier. 
I'm just not. You could easily derail a gluten-free yeah. diet and eat nothing but donuts. You ain't healthy and it's you're like, not It's like people who shop at Whole Foods, so they assume that because it's all organic, it's yes. all healthy. It's all healthy. But that's not true. I mean, no. they've got delicious brownies. Totally. There. It's just it's like... Yeah, deli- all kinds of delicious brownies in right? the state. So, I mean, it's not necessarily healthy. But I feel, I figure keto is the same. It is possible to be, to be vegan and be unhealthy. I've met yeah. a lot of vegans who don't actually eat vegetables. Like, they... What are they eating? <laughs> Lots of bread. Like rice. I lived and, with one. Yeah, okay. rice and bread. Like and Cheetos. You could probably, maybe, maybe you could eat Cheetos. That's interesting. I don't know. I don't know because it's not real cheese. I have no idea. I'm just saying like there are, there, it, there is no categorically safe and healthy diet that eliminates yeah. lots of things. So people think, oh, I am keto, I am paleo, I am vegan, therefore all of my choices are, are safe and healthy choices. Yeah. And it's like, mm, not necessarily. That's not how any of it works. When you're operating from a place of fear and you're not asking those questions right. and you're not trying to put the building blocks together, it is possible to derail anything. I mean, as far as I can tell, this book does not prescribe any kind of diet plan. It's about identifying what works for you, how you feel about food, how you think about food, identifying what's really important to you, and then tackling those things. And it really prioritizes self-care, which I think is really great, and talks about kind of um, by eating well and eating healthy, that that's a form of self-care. Ooh. That self-care isn't necessarily like, hey, you, go, you went and got a pedicure, like, check off your self-care, then you go home and you, like, eat a pizza alone, <laughs> which I totally used to do. I totally used to do, too. So I would get sad. Yeah. I loved pizza all by myself. I still love pizza. I love, I love oh. pizza. So, <laughs> but there are things I catch myself doing now that I'm more self-aware of it since I've been in therapy for so long, and there, there are patterns when I'm sad, what do I choose to fill the void with? Right. And that void is I don't realize that I'm throwing things into it to get rid of it. Yeah. Right? It's just I might catch myself and then I'm like, oh, I need, I'm, I'm, I need to stop. I'm sad. Yeah. What am I sad about? Where did this come from? Right. Like I have, instead of addressing the sad, I have distracted myself with a coping mechanism that is strong and powerful, and they talk about that in the book too. PTSD, um, trauma, it happens. It's real. It's legit. And then when the brain recognizes that you're coming back to that again, it gives you a warning and you... It triggers a set of behaviors. I don't have to explain this to you. I know you yeah. know better than I do. Um, it's when you're in a safe situation and you can't ramp yourself down to be like, actually, the danger isn't here. The danger isn't here. And like veterans have it. Where do I know this? Um, it's a it's a thing. I still have some. Yeah. I had a lot as a you know you can imagine what mine's connected to as someone that's been raped. Um, it's it's hard to be at home. I will never be a hundred percent comfortable or safe in the presence of say, someone who's larger than me, and angry. Oh, Again, I'm constantly aware. Yeah. And that's where the shaming comes in, right? Like, he's harmless. I'm like, until he's mad. Yeah. Until I've said no. Until I've been like, you shouldn't have done that. Yeah. I w- you need to stop that. You know? Like, I see that. I've seen these situations turn. Which is, which is like, it's easy to, it's easier to shut down the conversation that food's just fine. You're a vegan. What are you worried about? Then it is to look at your gut is great. As I've said in the mantra, your gut is great. What's your gut telling you right now? You know what's really interesting about the gut is that you have a ton of serotonin in your gut. Serotonin yes. receptors. It's, some actually refer to it as your second brain. God. Which is why they talk about trusting your gut. Because... That I did not know. Yeah. They call it a second brain. I went to one of those places in Thailand that do like... Fast and colonics. Oh yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, when I was like, I'm gonna stop drinking. I'm gonna stop taking drugs. Um, and my mom had just had cancer and chemotherapy, and she was like, her skin was gray. So I was like, we're gonna go to Thailand for a month. We're gonna fast and detox and clean yeah. our bums from the inside out. And I I learned a lot about the gut and gut flora and fauna and function and whatnot during that month that I was not eating and rinsing. Uh, it was, it was, but that I did not, I did not hear. They talked about how like the word, like the Russian word, uh, uh, like zhuvot is, is stomach, which comes from the Russian word zhuv, which is life, and how it's, it's all roots of the same concept, and, but like no one talked about serotonin. It's part of the reason why if you go like on an antidepressant, they talk about like gut problems. Wow. That you sometimes you get those. 
It's because you have so many like serotonin. Um, Interesting. So that's why there's a whole. Because well, when I was diagnosed with celiac, they were like, there's, here's a list of drugs you can't ever take. And I'm like, I remember some of them were antidepressants. Yeah. And I'm like, is there gluten in these? And they're like, no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I can't remember like all the data, but there's like even maybe more neurons connecting like the messages going from gut to brain than brain to gut. So your gut sends your brain lots and lots of messages. So maybe all that crazy stuff. Because when I talk to people that don't, there, there's a, there's a, when you are managing something like autism, it's easy to get on the woo-woo train and get further and further and further away from Western medicine. Yeah. And I don't criticize anyone who's done that. Um, but I've been in rooms with people where they're like, oh, you need to put him on a gluten-free diet. And I'm like, well, he's never had gluten. Yeah. Oh, honey, do you know what gluten is? And I'm like, bitch, I'm celiac. <laughs> Let me tell you, I know what gluten is, where it is. You can tell me how safe that whiskey is, and I'm going to tell you to go fuck yourself. Mm. Like, like whiskey and bourbon, when did that become safe for anyone? Like, right? Anyway, sorry. That's my, that's my <laughs> tangent. Like, people that don't have celiac will tell you that these are okay, safe. Yeah, anyone that. that, like, can have a reaction to it, it's like, I don't care. Um, but all that just to say that, that there's a whole strain in the autism community of folks that talk about gut health, but unfortunately it's they're, they're of that ilk where it's just hard to take them seriously. So maybe I need to go look for the grain of truth in some of the things that are said. Yeah. I mean, there's really interesting stuff about gut. The gut. <laughs> gut. In this book. Which oh, book? it's not actually in this book. I'm sorry. Oh. That's somewhere else. We're off the uh, reservation. Yeah. So... Um, I went, yeah, I did go off the reservation on that. It's not in the book. But um, I don't know if there's anything else I really want to call out in this book because so much of it is really personalized. It's about kind of, you know, walking through these exercises. Um, I underlined a lot. but You did. I did underline a lot. I'm like, you read this with, like, what, what, what's the book club? Whoever's read this book club, if you're here, it's in the Facebook. You it's, clearly it's done an Facebook. amazing job because, like, she has not just read the book; she has like it's, read with intention. <laughs> it's a private Facebook group, oh and so okay, I um, I don't want to call it out too much, but there okay. might be people who are in here. Um, I thought that this was interesting. There was like this whole exercise around like how much eating do you do when you're doing other things, and I don't know about you, but I'm always eating like on the go. Um, it's rare. I keep protein bars in my car because m- m- six days out of seven, I will finish a workout and not have time to eat before I take the kids to school. Yeah. So, pro- I, so I will eat a lot of protein bars on the go, but I don't like to eat while I'm doing other things. Yeah. I eat at my desk a lot. Like, I'll be in front of the computer, like, noshing my my computer, my laptop is disgusting. <laughs> it's covered in like, Good to know. It's like covered in crumbs. I mean, because I'm always like just shoving it in there, um, which is the opposite of mindfulness, right? Because like, where's my attention? My yeah. attention is on my emails. It's on my IMs. It's on, I don't know, the internet. It's not on like this whole process. Yeah. Um, and I... Maybe a year ago, I started reading The Beck Diet Solution, which is similar to this in that it's a diet book that's not a diet plan. And she has you taking, like, step one, step two. And one of the early steps was if you're going to eat, you always have to be sitting down. It doesn't say you have to be sitting at a table, right? Hmm. That always be sitting down. And I was like, oh, I'm always sitting down when I eat. And then I realized that's not true. That's not true. I'm usually standing up. I'm, like, walking from, like, one place to another, like, eating still. So, it's funny, once you start tuning into these things, like, oh. you think, oh, yeah, I'm always sitting down when I eat. Mm, maybe not. Maybe not. But then you start to catch it, right? Wait, so why is it important to sit down? So, it's, um, again, it's, it's almost, and Judith Beck doesn't talk about this being mindfulness. She doesn't use that terminology, I don't believe. Okay. But um, it's about kind of being in the moment, eating <clears throat> it, enjoying it, getting to experience it versus, like, you're just shoveling it. No awareness around what you're eating or how much you're eating. Did you ever watch that movie, Never Been Kissed? Yes. Remember when she when she gets stoned and she eats, and the, she's pie. Like, she eats the pie? Yes. And she's like, who ate my pie? pie. 
So totally. So and I get like that. Some I mean, it's I totally not, get it's like not that. quite that. Um, when this marriage, unfortunately, ends, when like Alex goes to the fridge, he's like, "Where'd my beef and broccoli go?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Shiloh did it." <laughs> Where's my pie? Where's my yeah. beef and broccoli? Oh my God. No, and I I don't disengage quite that much. I don't disassociate to the point where it's like. Oh, who ate all these chips? Who ate the pizza? Like, I know what I ate. But it's strong. There's a, there's a UK series. It's on YouTube called Secret Eaters. <gasps> I've seen it. It's I, on YouTube. I, yes, yes. I cried my eyes out when I watched the first one because my heart just broke for these people. Like, you volunteered for this. You know there are cameras in your home. They underreport what they eat. They're like, oh, I don't have... And not by a little. Uh-uh. It's like, whoa. Low battery. We're getting a warnings. Uh oh. They're like, why? I don't understand why I'm not losing weight. I don't understand why I'm gaining weight. I don't eat that much. And then they follow them around like 24 seven. Oh my god. Yeah, and they have the can and they're eating. I mean, I mean that's for me like that's why tracking is so important. Yes. Right. Yes. And writing it by hand, that always says. Yeah. You I remember more if you write it than if you type it in like a, an app or something. Yeah, I do the app. But even then, like if I better than nothing. Like if I don't eat well I don't want to track it I don't want to put it in it's like I, saw I don't, don't want to I don't want to see it <laughs> <laughs> like I oh I ate like three pieces of pizza <laughs> <laughs> if I don't put it in there it didn't really happen it didn't really happen <laughs> 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 did really? so I didn't really shop no yeah so it's like a way of face yeah, denial so oh God. <laughs> which is oh. why I mean just monitoring itself is such a powerful tool I guess I should see if anybody is how many can we can you see on there I can't read that far, but I, I never get up. Oh, oh somebody, the Martian. The Martian is on my list to head to me. The Martian is amazing. With the other books. So I've talked before if, uh, in some of the previous podcasts, um, not not the Morning Mantra podcast, but the other old podcast I used to be on. I talked about how I went to a wedding with my husband, and I just sat in the corner and read the whole the whole wedding. Like, I just didn't want to. I'm like, I, I'm reading this book. Fuck off. It was Wait, like during the wedding ceremony and everything? No, I, I managed to adult during the ceremony. Don't okay. go to the reception. I'm like, I don't know anybody. Kindle. And I read The Martian. Nice. I like that as a coping skill. Yeah. Because I can do social awkwardness at a, at a social <laughs> Oh, and then Alice's analyst would come over and be like, because this woman worked for him. And like, the analyst would come over and be like, Mrs. Fleming, are you okay? I'm like, no, give me a martini. And I was just going to keep reading. I'm just going to read my If book. I bark correctly, they won't come back. I mean, because you can put it, like, I don't know about Blackberries. I know nothing about Blackberries. But, I mean, you've got a Kindle app on your smartphones, right? Do yes. Do you have a Kindle app? I do, but I don't use, I don't like to read that way. I know that sounds kind okay. of silly. Um, I like to read on the Kindle because it feels different and it looks different. It, it hits my eyes differently, my precious little eyes. Um, it feel, it's, it's the same, when I'm reading a screen that's backlit, it, there's, a, there's a burn that I don't get from the Kindle. Yeah. Okay. So I don't do, I respond to emails and texts and I can work really quickly on the phone, but none of it re requires Lots the type of, of thought and staring at. Yeah. Can we really call what you carry a phone though? Is it more of an antiquated type, right? It, you know, it's, a, it's, it, we, we call it, thank God for it, because I'm going to be hella harder to contact when Blackberry goes out of business. Are they going to go out of business? Well, if you to text 100 words a minute on the little flip phones. Well, I mean, just I'll just stop. <laughs> I remember those days where it was like one, one, like until you got yeah, to the exactly. letter you wanted, right. and it took yeah. like twenty minutes. Well, and it. that's me trying to like work with the iPad. So, what's your resistance to the like an iPhone? It's useless. Okay. It's completely useless. I can't type. I can't do anything on it. It's a toy. If I wanted a toy, I would buy toys. I have an iPad, and my iPad's function its functionality is limited by my ability to use that keyboard to do productive things, and it's a zero. So why would I buy something smaller than my iPad if I can't make my mini iPad that size function? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Typing is shitty and terrible. That's true. And their spell check is the worst. Their auto, and the auto predictor, correct. it is terrible. I don't know who wrote it over at Apple, but I'm like, this is a non-functional AI. Yeah. Like, I have to go back there. there it'll, it's like... I, I, I'll, I'll say like O O Y U, and it doesn't know it's you. I'm like, it'll, I'll, I click on the word, and all these come up like, you don't think maybe That's it's true. two letters? That's true. Really? Like, of all the combinations? Anyway, so I'm like, <laughs> why do I have to retype this fucking word? What is wrong with your system? Your ass sucks, Apple. 
So yeah, I'm sticking with the Blackberry. When the Blackberry is gone, guess what? I'm getting a flip phone, just like my granny and her drug dealer had. I will put a Wi-Fi on on my iPad so people who really need to text me can send me texts for me to call them and say, I read your text. I'm not responding to it because I use an iPad. That's what's going to happen. Right. I like it. We just started watching The West Wing last night. Never seen it before. It was the first episode. And they have pagers. They have pagers. And Brenda and I were like, remember pagers? Oh my God. Amazing. Yes, you back like in the days when I was a teenager, before I had status and before I had a pager. <laughs> Child called Quest. Well, we have been going now for almost oh, yes. two hours. We have been running out of battery. And That's so, true. yay, these are the books you should buy and not read. If you have a suggestion for a book that's fantastic that we should, that you should, you think we should discuss in the next book club meeting, let me know because we probably won't have time to read it, but we can skim it, talk about it, or yeah. find someone who did read it yeah. that can come talk to us about why it's important. So if this was fun, let me know. If it sucked, let me know. You yes. can either mail um, uh, feedback at coachedinlove.com or email me directly, mk at coachedinlove.com. Like yeah. Yeah. Well, because with the nice list now, we have. Hi, baby. Yes. Yes. Okay. I'll come get you. Um, so when I when I here's the evolution. I started the nice list. Yeah. Thinking just to block theft. Thinking maybe we get thirty people. And I mean, come on. We got three hundred and twenty. Like crazy. It was stupid. You cannot with a simple Gmail account email that many people. Oh, I've never I, tried to email that many people, so I, I wouldn't know that. I tried. I got I got trouble. I got so I started Coach MK Fleming when I got Twitch, so that I would have like more separation of like church and state in my yeah. email inbox and it would be less messy. Um, plus I really hate Apple's email server. Like mm. it's terrible. Like that email app is the worst. So I'm like trying, so I'm like, I'm going back into Gmail. I've got this uh, coach MK Fleming, a gmail.com account. Um, but I can't send for 300 people either through my Apple account or through Gmail. So I had to upgrade like constant contact and then constant contact there are, there are all kinds of things in place to stop spammers from getting you. So then I ended up having to buy a domain. Oh my gosh. I know. So there's that. So that was the evolution. It wasn't like a targeted, I'm going to do this. It's just like, yeah. well, this was really successful and now I can't use my email account. Might as well build a website. Might as well. So I have one and uh, it's not, it's nowhere near ready yet. I saw it. But I've been there. Did you? Yeah. Sweet. It's like, it's like coming soon, maybe. Coming soon, maybe, yeah. <laughs> next time or yeah. would like to not read together let me know mk at coachandlove.com or feedback at coachandlove.com don't forget to check out instagram morning mantra pod my podcast has an instagram that's morning mantra pod i'm coach mk fleming um on instagram as well and i don't really have an online presence no <laughs> no that's okay <laughs> i thought you are here i mean i have enough of a digital yeah. footprint that if my husband ever ran for office which he would never do that it would be like, oh, I would sink your campaign <laughs> with my digital footprint. I love it. Sorry about I that. I love it. No, I think I think what we need to do is kick it off next time with bubble tea. Korean bubble tea. Yes, bubble tea. I'm all about it. I got I got to find out what all the fuss is about. I mean, you just got to. I mean, now. salty balls. Amazing. In a drink. Yay! What could go wrong? I mean, everything. Just don't try to run Houston Marathon the next day. I think we're gonna be good. Okay. Nothing new on race day or the day before. Your coach, your love, let's go win at the week. I've got a mantra to record and, you know, clearly some kids electronic to, devices. To to, yeah, I got I to gotta go back to adulting. But see you guys later. Thank you for joining us.
Bye, Bye. people. That's one.